So, welcome. Uh, we've got a couple of still grabbing their meals. Don't make me rush you. But welcome. We're so glad to have you here today for the first session of the Marriage Water. Uh, listen, a uh, Marriage Commission. Listen, learn, lead. Um, as you'll notice, we do have some members that are joining us up here on the screen remotely. Uh, that'll be an option throughout all the sessions to be in person or remote. We understand some people maybe can't be here, just don't feel comfortable being in a crowd. We want to respect that. Uh, so I will explain the process we're going to follow in a minute. But first, I want to introduce our listening group over here. Mayor Rudy Durham is right here in the middle. We have uh, City Manager Donna Barron. She's my boss, so she goes second after the mayor. <laughs> Assistant City Manager Melinda Goller. Police Chief Kevin Deeper and Councilman Bob Troyer. Each week we'll have a different council member sitting in. The mayor will be here for all of them. Different council members sitting in each time, so they all get a chance to participate in this process and hear, hear what they need to hear. Uh, my name is James Tunkey. I've traded emails with all of you. I'm the community relations director for this time. Uh, scattered around the team, we have our tech crew, uh, Ryan and Matt and Matthew, and then uh, back here we have Jennifer taking notes for us. We'll talk more about the process in a minute, but first, does uh, the mayor have a microphone? Mm -hmm. I'd like the mayor to just give a brief welcome. Ready? Good evening. Uh, I want to thank you for participating in this, and hopefully the folks on Zoom can hear me too. If you'd raise your hand, somebody. And uh, Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, thank you all for participating. This is going to be an adventure for me and you, I'm, I'm assuming. And we'll see. Hopefully it'll all work out well. Uh, we, the city folks that were introduced a minute ago and uh, uh, the council member and myself, we're here to listen to what you have to say um, about your experiences in Louisville uh, so that we may become stronger and a better community. I plan to be quiet and listen. Uh, I'm not known as a, a being very verbose. Uh, it's a matter of pretty quiet most of the time, uh, but uh, until he has an opinion. Well, that, that is true. <laughs> See, I'm going in the wrong direction sometimes. Uh, but, but I plan to be more quiet than normal over the next couple of sessions, so that I can listen carefully to all of you. Um, there will be a time later for us to discuss solutions and improvements. That's all I have to say. I'll tell you, one of the first things, uh, you all saw in the email, a lot of this is triggered by what happened to George Floyd, where we need to have a discussion as a country, as a community. The mayor very quickly said, I want to hear from you. And so that's what we're trying to do now, uh, through a process of learning and discussion, and ultimately, potentially a process of change, where there's always things we can do better, always things we maybe should be doing that we haven't thought of. That's what we want to come out of this. So very quickly, I'll explain the room to you, and then our process, and then I'm going to go sit down, and I'm going to be quiet, and I am not usually known as a quiet person, so that will be difficult for me. Um, the room is set to be physically distanced, so while you're in your seat, if you want to cut your mask, feel free to do that. Uh, I plan to, uh, but it is physically distanced. Um, we do ask, as you're, if you're getting out and moving around the room, we do ask you to put on a face cover just for everyone's safety and protection, just as a precaution, just in case. Um, if you're, uh, for those of you at home, you don't have to put your face cover on your phone. Uh, uh, the restroom is just outside the store on the left. If you need to go, just go. Wait on me. Uh, if you're in the middle of talking, maybe wait until you're done talking. Uh, the, in front of you, there's a number of papers. One of them, there's a notepad and pens, uh, so you can take notes if you want to or make note of questions you want to ask. There is a sheet that has just some biography information about roughly half of the members. Some of you set it up this afternoon. I was already here setting up the room, so you're not in there. We'll be in there next time. Uh, so that's just so you get to know people I know. Some of you already know each other, go to church. I know there's a few West Side people that were congregating earlier. Um, but just so you know who's in the room. Uh, additionally, in front of you, there is a uh, just a list of tips for contributors. And I'm not going to run through them, but just some basic ideas of how to keep the conversation flowing in a, in a very productive, positive, and, and you know, time-aware manner. And then lastly, there is an order form for next week's dinner. This week, we just got a selection, and um, hopefully you found something that works for you. Next week, you get to have a choice. So if you'll just fill that out before you leave, and when you're done, just leave it and your name plate on your desk, and we'll pick them up after this. We'll take care of that. When we're, we're going to start speaking, Matt, who's in the, different from Matthew. Matt confuses you, I know. If I hire the same name, I don't get their names. 
So Matt back here has a, a wireless microphone. So when it's time to speak, if you want to speak, just get Matt's attention, he'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, he will sanitize it between each use. So if you're concerned about that, we got you covered. Uh, for those of you who are on the Zoom, up, uh, on the big screen, a great time for you to talk is going to be when the microphone's moving from person to person, because there's a gap. Uh, we do ask when you're not speaking, please go ahead and mute. Uh, we love your kids and your pets and your neighbors, but, well, they weren't invited. Uh, so please mute when you're not speaking, but when you're ready to speak, we want to hear from you, even though you're not in the room. You're a very important part of the commission. Everybody has a chance. If you want to sit there and not say a word, you're welcome to do that. Um, but we brought a lot of people here because we think all of you have very strong voices and we want to hear those voices. Uh, with that, are there any questions? So this will be the arrangement for the first two weeks. We'll rearrange the room for the rest. All sessions will be here at 6.30 on Thursdays. Oh, one other note that is on your, your, your tips for contributors. Just a reminder that we are recording these sessions. We'll put them on the city website tomorrow if all this tech works, Monday if we had a glitch. Uh, so that people who aren't here today but want to know the conversation's about, they can witness the discussion, they can offer feedback. We encourage you to tell your neighbors, your friends, your family, your congregation members. Get on there and watch the video. If you have something to add, add to it. We will bring to you the comments we receive through the website. Uh, but also a reminder, since it's on the website where literally anybody that wants to watch it can, uh, there are people of all ages and all sensibilities and sensitivities. So just be aware of that as we go through this well. Any questions? For then a quick question. Yes. If you guys are using like mics, could you possibly move um, whatever way you're going to get through closer to the speaker? It's a bit like echoey. I can't quite. Did you get that, Matt? Move, move the speaker closer. Um, yeah, she's getting an echo. She's getting an echo. Okay. So we'll, we'll try to address that. We'll work on that. Um, or is it just me? Is anyone else on Zoom having a hard time hearing? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's challenging. Okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do to fix that. This is the first week we might not quite have it down. We'll work, there's an echo back there. We will work on that. So, um, and then I thought of one other thing I wanted to add and I forgot what it was. So, I'll think of it later. I will put that in there also. So we have scheduled this to be seven sessions, seven weeks. We chose that because we wanted to have plenty of time to listen, to hear the experiences and the stories, to get a feel for the perspective of what's going on in our community, and then have time to study together and have time to develop ideas together. If this group, including the ones online, if you feel like that's too long of a time and you want to squeeze it down and maybe have just one really big Saturday, we're open to that. Uh, we thought this was the most time-friendly method, but if not, just let me know. Obviously, too late for tonight, but let me know afterward and we will see if we can adjust that. Um, the other thing I was going to get, I had lost completely, it's just left my head. Yes? Uh, when will you be posting the video and will you send us a link that we can share? We hope the video will be posted tomorrow during the day. That's what Matt and Matthew are going to work on. And assuming all the technology works and we get good video and audio, they will do that. It might be Monday. And as soon as it's available, I'll email all of them. Just so you know, it's on the city website and the page is called Listen, Learn, Lead. So when you go to the city website, if you go to the, on the navigation at the top of the page, where it says about us, you'll see a listen, learn, lead, listen, learn, lead link. And I'll be sure to send the link to you also as soon as the video is available. We'll put it up there every week, and we'll leave them up there through the whole session so people can binge watch like Netflix. If <laughs> um, last thing, when you're going to speak, you have your name in front of you, but we might not be able to see it this far away, or people on screen probably can't see it. So when you're ready to speak, if you just go ahead and say your name before you start speaking, that'd be very helpful also. So with that, I'm going to go back to my chair, and whoever wants to volunteer to start us, the question we're asking today is, we want to hear what is your experience as a black man or a black woman in the United States, and especially in Louisville. And whoever wants to go first, Matt will bring you the microphone. All right. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, so I decided to start off first because I'm not at my word count for the day, so I want to go ahead and get it out of the way. Uh, my name is Victor Jones. I was invited to this meeting through my school district. I'm an employee of Louisville ISD. I'm an assistant principal. A little bit about me, I'm born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, went to school in Nashville, Tennessee, and after graduation moved here. Um, just a little bit about my story. Um, 
I have two sisters. Um, both of my grandfathers were pastors, so I grew up kind of in the church. Not kind of, in the church. Um, besides that, though, growing up, I never had any issues in Birmingham. And most time when people hear about Birmingham, Alabama, they go to the, through the history lessons of everything that, uh, you know, was accounted for in Birmingham with um, the racial profiling, racism, all the different things. But me personally, I never experienced that. Um, at Tennessee State, I went to a historically black college, which was Tennessee State. Never had any experiences there, not even in Nashville, the country music city capital of the world. Moved here to Texas and started my career. Um, went to school, got my master's and my PhD. And through that, still never had any issues. Now, I'm a person that enjoys the outdoors and enjoys toys. So I had a really nice boat. And at that time, I was living down um, in um, Duncanville near Joe Pool Lake. And I had my boat out there. And um, that was the first time I really got called a racial slur out of my name. And it, it never really impacted me because I have friends across every spectrum of, of life, um, different races, different countries, different organizations. And the most, the, the, the things I got most were when they see that I had nice things, well, what do you do for a living? I got that every single time. Well, what do you do? They see my butt, well, what do you do? And one time someone uh, had been drinking and they pulled up next to um, the, the boat ramp and they start trying to get into it with me and I didn't know who they were or what happened and that's when they started to use uh, you know racial terms towards me that is the only time in my life that I experienced something like that and it kind of taken me aback because you know again a lot of my friends uh, different races and cultures and it really was shocking to me so for me my personal experience uh, was really here in Texas you know besides that uh, I've been in Louisville Four years, never had any incidents in Louisville. And um, because I know you asked about, you know, growing up as well as in, in Louisville. So personally had no issues in Louisville. Um, my neighborhood is multicultural. Everybody's around me is different races. And again, never had any issues. Um, so for me, everything that happened with the George Floyd, and before I even watched the video or anything that came up with it, I was really trying to stay away from it because I didn't want to get in, in, engulfed in it because I heard so much surrounding it. And when I finally did watch the video, I was very shocked at what happened because many times you see people not compliant or rebelling against police. And when he, over $20, you know, ended up dead, when he complied, he asked him to stop and ended up dead. It made me feel or look like, well, if I'm not dressed in uh, slacks and a button down or if I'm not going to, to my job or I'm in a suit and tie, how am I being viewed? Am I a threat? And I have two boys, and it made me start considering what would happen with and for them should they be approached or should something happen. So it was, it was a scary time for me with everything that I've been surrounded by. And also with social media, you kind of see where the line splits and the, the fact that most people are on this kick about Republicans or Democrats, whether you know, we're still one nation under God, honestly. And we should be looking at it in that aspect. So a lot of times we are not, you know, governed by what party we represent, but what's going to be the betterment of our country and our world, you know, uniformly. So that's me. That's, that's kind of what I'm about. Um, my campus is multicultural. I've always been on campuses that have had different spectrums of life, spectrums of, of um, social class. And, you know, anytime something like that would possibly arise, I try to squash it just because it shouldn't be like that overall. So I hope that helps. You want to go? Okay, go, I got one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tracy Petaway, and um, I did submit my little bio thing, so I guess I won't go through all of that. Um, I'm from Louisiana, but I'm here in the nation of Texas, and that's what I call it, the nation of Texas, because there's nowhere else like Texas. Um, I did attend HBCU, and um, I'm credentialed academically, and what I will say is when I was um, the academic advising coordinator at one of our beloved universities, um, I had to prove that I earned my doctorate. 
they wouldn't call me Dr. Petaway, but they called everyone in the office Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. So it was um, very disheartening because I have two doctoral degrees and they wouldn't even, I mean, it's, a, it's academia where you have students there who are vying to earn um, their higher educational degrees and my, my staff and uh, the immediate uh, supervisors would not call me that and they actually would tell students to call me Tracy. And um, I was very humbled by that, but I did, um, I understood that although the degrees do not define me, them not acknowledging my accomplishments does not mean that I did not accomplish that. So I was able to move forward, but it was a very humbling experience. So just as uh, Dr. Jones mentioned, I didn't experience it until I moved to the nation of Texas and uh, it was a very, um, I came here, no family, no friends, just me. Um, secondly, I will say uh, my son, you know, the situation with George Floyd, um, all the situations that have happened, I have a son who I love dearly. He's a graduate of Marcus High School and he earned an academic scholarship to Baylor University. He wants to be an engineer like his father. I'm terrified because when my son got his driver's license, I had to have a conversation with him. This is how you respond if you're ever stopped. This is what you do. I said, and don't say a word until I get there. You tell them that you want a lawyer and to call your parent, and I'm there. Don't say anything because your life depends on it. I shouldn't have to tell a 16-year-old that, but that's the reality that we live in. I say, your parents, we've done what God has blessed us, and it doesn't matter. They're gonna see you, and that's gonna be the problem. And I took him to, this, to see the movie, um, what was that movie with the kid that was driving the car? and. Okay, it was a movie, and I took my son to see it. And after he watched that movie, he did not want to drive anymore. He's like, I'm done. I mean, because the young man, they, the officer said that he had a gun when it was a hairbrush. And his father told him, don't take your hands off the steering wheel if you're ever stopped. And he did, and it cost him his life. But here in uh, actual Louisville, when I moved, my, my husband and I, we um, actually, we had uh, just purchased a Mercedes and we were on our way from church. We had just had a baby dedication for our daughter. And if those of you who've been here a while, there was a Luby's in the Vista Ridge Mall. And we were on our way to Luby's and a police officer pulled us over. Um, and he said for my husband to get out of the car. And my husband's like, why? What did I do? What, what was wrong? And he said, the car has been reported stolen. We had just purchased that Mercedes off at Park Place. So it had new car tags, so it wasn't reported stolen. And he could not provide documentation that said it was reported stolen, but he searched the car and my husband, my son got out of his seat to turn around and was looking over the back window and my daughter was in her car seat. And I was just sitting there crying and praying because I didn't know what was gonna happen. So that was an experience back in 2006. It wasn't that far ago. Um, secondly, um, we live in a, 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 a community and um, I had, we built our home and I had walked out to my mailbox. And for those who may know, it's called, um, it's a cul-de-sac in Louisville, right off of uh, a cul-de-sac. And our officer came through the, the circle and he stopped and asked me what was I doing I was actually getting mail out of my mailbox and I guess he didn't think I lived at the home that I was in front of and he asked to see my driver's license I said well it's in my house because I don't 
I'm walking out to my mailbox and my neighbor came outside, thankfully, and the sad thing is that my neighbor should not have had to come outside to vouch to say that this is my house because it's my house, but it happened. I was the first black pres uh, PTA president at Marcus High School and was elected. And the principal had to sit down with me and tell me that the school's not ready for this. And I had to step down from being the president of the PTA at Marcus High School. Unbelievable to me. Very humbling. And I'm actually on the National PTA Board of Directors, the first black from the state of Texas. But I can't be the PTA president at Marcus High School. Unbelievable. So there's just a plethora of things. Do I think all officers are bad? Of course not. I'm one of the chaplains for the Louisville Police Department. I didn't tell the officers when they stopped me. I did talk to the powers that be about it, but I don't think that. I, I had a dear relationship with Chief Tittle with the fire department. I'm one of their chaplains as well. I don't think there's all good or all bad in any race, but um, it's just very hurtful, the things that have been experienced and uh, that should not have happened. Thank you. All right. Uh, first, I want to thank the mayor for uh, inviting us here. I, it really meant a lot to me when I, when I saw that you wanted to reach out. You know, this was your idea to bring us together and, and just have a listening ear. And I thought it was, uh, it was really impressive. So thank you for having us here. Thank you, Chief, for joining us and uh, Councilman and City Manager. It uh, really means a lot to me and I'm sure everyone else here. My name is Winston Edmondson and I, um, I want to talk about what it, what it means to me to live in America and in Louisville. To me, America in Louisville, it's still the land of opportunity for everyone, for all races, but there are certain elements that are required that I think there's a deficit out there. It's, um, and that's inspiration and motivation. And uh, I think when folks experience that, they really can reach for the stars and achieve it, but a lot of folks, they just, they just don't have it. Um, so, and I wonder what we as a community can do to address that deficit. So, you know, when I was growing up, my parents always told me that if I work hard, if I'm respectful, I can achieve anything. And, you know, they were convincing. I believed it. When I moved to Louisville in seventh grade, I was, uh, I remember I was at Delay Middle School and one of my teachers, I was in reading class. One of my teachers, Mrs. Boyd, pulled me aside and said, Winston, your reading level is really impressive. I think you need to come on to my other class and to leap. Um, I, think I think you're gifted. I, I, I want to bring you over and, and, uh, and work with you there. And she did. And I remember she told me as well, you can achieve anything. Um, work hard. You can achieve anything. And, and I believed it. Again, when I moved to Louisville, I met uh, one of the most inspirational uh, figures. Uh, we had a, a really dynamic mayor at the time. We still do. But uh, Bobby Mitchell, I met Bobby Mitchell. And I was just a little kid. And I remember just being so impressed uh, with this black woman that was in this power, powerful role and yet so down to earth and willing to talk to me and talk to everyone. And she told me, Winston, you can achieve anything if you work hard, if you work for it. And I believed it. And so I think that's the, the message that um, we need to drive home, not just for young kids, but even adults. Um, they can achieve so much more if they have that, that peace, that motivation, that inspiration. And so, again, I wonder as a community and as uh, a municipality, what can we do to kind of light that fire under people? And, you know, so I, I, I've heard of roles like um, diversity um, manager or director of diversity. And, you know, I, I think those roles can be beneficial not to try to bring folks, um, you know, hire minorities and, and just you know, get them hired and, and kind of check off a quota. But I feel like perhaps a role like that that can work with other department heads and kind of brainstorm, what can we do to educate folks about opportunities and uh, motivate them and inspire them to achieve more? 
Um, you know, so here in city staff, I don't know what percentage of city staff are minorities. Chief, I don't know what percentage of uh, the police department are minorities. But whatever that percentage is, I don't feel like the problem is that we're holding minorities back. I just feel like perhaps we're not inspiring them and, and showing them the opportunities that are out there. Um, so if we had a diversity manager that could maybe get out in the community and, you know, talk about some of the roles within the city and talk about opportunities, um, go to, you know, maybe have some career fairs that are specifically designed to just educate people about what's out there and what they can, you know, strive for and achieve. Um, our economic development um, board, I, you know, there are a lot of minorities that have um, just business ideas, but they don't know where to start. And it's intimidating. You know, what do you have to do to, to start a business? What do you have to fill out? If we had an uh, economic develop, um, developer that maybe would do a little more hand-holding and have some seminars and bring folks in and, and really help them understand what, what needs to be done and that they can do this, kind of, you know, be a cheerleader. Um, you know, we have the Explorers Program for, for young children. I think that's a great program. I don't know what the percentage of minorities are, but I'd love to increase that. I'd love to um, celebrate the existing children that are in that program, you know. I mean, look at social media. We can, we can produce videos and, and show the, the privilege and the honor that it is to be a, a young explorer and a, kind of a junior policeman, if you will. Throw that on social media and let, and let you know, minorities see that and be inspired and, and, and want to achieve that. Um, you know, the, um, our police department has just amazing um, people. And, and you know what? It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, if you compare it with other cities, we've got great salary, great benefit benefits. And you know what? I, I feel like if we just reach out to um, the community at large and kind of educate them about, wow, you know what? I could be a policeman. If, I, if right now I feel like the police are the enemy or I feel like perhaps persecuted, maybe I could join that team and, and be the change that I want to see. And, um, you know, let's, I, I, again, motivation and inspiration, that's where I think we can um, get more inclusion. Because I, I don't feel like the problem is blacks are being held back. I, I just don't. I feel like they're not reaching for the stars. And if we can come together as a community and as a city and help them, inspire them, I, I really think we can, that can help make a difference. Hold on one second. Hi, um, I'm Ketia Ifulu, and I attend Louisville High School. Um, I'm going into my senior year now, and um, I've been the student council's multicultural officer for three years now. And um, I just want to say, like, my first year, it was, like, kind of hard. At um, I was a multicultural officer at Louisville High School, Kilo, the 10th, 9th and 10th campus. And I remember I wanted to do something for Black History Month because I realized, like, Harmon, they have their uh, assembly and stuff. And I was like, okay, maybe I should do, like, a cool little week for um, Black History Month. And I remember... Um, going to my principal, asking her if, like, I could get this idea approved. And then she was like, well, I don't want to end up on Fox News if you put up this. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to end up on Fox News? Because I guess um, during that time, there was still, like, Black Lives Matter stuff going on. But, um, like, I just wanted to do something, like, um, putting education and diversity in like a whole and like make cute little buttons, shirts and do little stuff for the students as well. And like, I really worked hard on that project, like trying to get like everybody to be included, not just us black people, but like us as a community. Cause in school it's really hard to just focus on one race, but we do have to celebrate diversity as well in education. And that was like my whole idea. And then presenting it to her, um, when she told me like she didn't want to approve it, like I bawled my eyes out because I was like, 
I've worked on this so hard. Why wouldn't you do this? And then she was like, well, I would like you to represent all cultures in the school as well. And I'm like, I have. Like, I go all out for Hispanic heritage, for um, Chinese New Year. And then when it's um, bl uh, when it's Black History Month, it's like, I got to, like, chill out on that. It's like, she was like, um, y'all only go hard whenever it's your month, but not like every day. And I was like, what? Okay. Like I was so confused and I was like so emotional at the point, at the time where it was like, I worked even more harder to like get this idea approved. I went to her like every day to be like, okay, is this better? Is this better? I tweaked it and it became so edited to where it was like, it wasn't even about us anymore. It was just about like other things and I just didn't understand. So I stopped, I didn't do it anymore. I was like, okay, I'm done with this. And like, and then other people would get on me, like they'll be like, how come you're not doing your job? How come you're not? And I'm like, well, there's nothing for me to do if somebody doesn't want me to like represent me as a whole. like. Um, growing up in Louisville, I never really thought about race at all. I never really thought about it until like I went to middle school and I started seeing myself tag on to like some of the black people. Cause I grew up like in fourth grade, I was like the only black girl in my class. Like I didn't relate to anybody until I went to middle school and that's when like I t tagged on to those black people and felt like that's how it should be to find myself as well. Cause I felt like I didn't fit in in some places and stuff. Cause there will be other black people as well who would be like, oh, you sound white or, oh, you like talk proper. And I'm like, well, um, I'm not really like from anywhere. Like my parents are um, Congolese as well. So they, so they tell me they're like, you don't need to be sounding ghetto or anything. You need to, keep it up so other people see you as like higher, like a hierarchy and all that. And yeah, so that's my experience being black in Louisville. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Penny Mallet, and I kind of broke mine up into sections of the questions that were being asked. What was my experience as a black woman in the United States? So as a black woman that will be 60 in 21 days, my experience has been vast. But for the time of this meeting, I'll just give you a cliff note of my life being black in the United States. When I first looked at that question, it took me days to come up with something to say. But I am a true Texan. I was born in San Antonio, Texas to a Creole mother from New Orleans, Louisiana, and a black father from Belfast, Tennessee. They could not have been more different. They met in San Antonio, Texas while my father was in the United States Army. My mother was born into a biracial marriage of 13 kids, and my father grew up on a farm. Growing up in San Antonio was amazing. By the way, go Spurs. <laughs> it was such a diverse community. Racism did not come into my life until I was about eight years old. When one of my classmates asked me, who was that white lady you were with at the shopping center this weekend? And I replied, you mean my grandmother? <laughs> After my father did his four years in the army, he went to work for Braniff Airlines. If you're old enough to know, that was an airline that was, I think, also here in Dallas at Love Field. And we traveled first class because you can fly for $5 back then because my dad was an employee. So during the summer, I would go visit my cousins and different areas and parts of the country. But my aunt on my dad's side, who lived in New York City, never had children. So my cousins and I, that were the same age, would go see her during the summertime and spend time. She was an RN, and she lived very well. Most black mothers that were educated back in the day could only be a nurse or a school teacher. 
So they did. My, aunt, my other aunt on my father's side was a professor at the University of Tennessee. I loved going to New York, and to today, it's still one of my favorite places to visit. I love the Broadway shows and eating off the street, having the street food. But I saw as a young girl from Texas that New York was so different than San Antonio. You see, in San Antonio, our population is only 7% black. So going to New York and seeing black people everywhere was a world of difference for me. For some reason, my father would let us fly to Tennessee to see my other grandparents. And then some years we drove. And it was an amazing experience. We would see all the mountains and everything. We were children and my parents would make it like a camping experience for my two brothers and me. We would stop at rest stops and eat and use the bathroom. And my father would cook food for the long trip. On the return trip, my grandmother would cook food and made the most amazing fried pies. But on one occasion, we had to make a bathroom stop, and it was outside of our scheduled stops. And I couldn't understand why my father kept passing up locations that had bathrooms. Well, finally we made a stop, and there were signs that said, color only, and white only. As a child, I could not understand why I couldn't go to the nice, clean bathroom. So as you see, flying for Braniff was a good experience for us to travel as black Americans. My grandmother on my mother's side, my white grandmother, she lived in San Antonio, and we saw her a lot until she passed when I was in high school. She would regularly buy me little socks and sew lace on them and take me to the theater via bus. My grandmother had a car, but she no longer drove. She was the person that introduced me to the Broadway theater. And every time it came to town, like the ballet during the holidays, she would take me and we would go. But I also noticed how people stared at us. You see, I assumed they stared because I looked like my father. My father was brown like me. And my mother looked like my grandmother. I did know that my grandmother was different, but I didn't know my grandmother was a different race. Within our own race, we are treat each other differently. The paper bag test. If you could pass the paper bag test, it was determined your ranking within the black community. It all started during slavery between the house Negroes and the field Negroes. And many of you may not know about the paper bag test, but it's a real thing. And it's also part of history as an exhibit at the National African American Museum in Washington, DC. My current husband is also Creole and comes from a completely Creole family. And he never heard of the paper bag test. So I was happy to show him the exhibit when we went to Washington, D.C. You see, my very own grandmother used to refer to my cousins and I as little brown kids. I loved my grandmother, and I know I never thought anything about it because I was dark. I looked like my dad. I didn't look like my other uncles and aunts and cousins with blonde hair and blue eyes. I was different. For the reference, for those of you who don't know what Creole is, it's a person of an ethnic group with a racial mixed background between West Africans and other races such as Europeans and sometimes South Asia and Native American people. My first marriage, I married a man that was adopted. His family came from Germany. His mother was a German and his father was a black soldier stationed in Germany. He is deceased now, he passed away with lung cancer, but we had a son. <coughs> and my son took on the skin color of his birth grandfather. As he grew up, he wanted to know why his skin was so different than our skin. And I would tell him, it's because God made you special. And oh boy, did I make a mistake. Because he, is, I think, I created a monster. That boy is now 42 years old, and he's grown up to be such a smart, amazing, good-looking man with an amazing career, who also married a white woman. And I have five amazing biracial grandkids who had asked at one point when they were little about their skin color. They did not know if they were white like their mother or considered black like my son. So you see, it's just a part of life. We are always told that if you have one 
drop of black blood by the white community, then you're considered white. So some of us could pass as white, and some of us did, because it provided a better opportunity back then. During a recent family reunion in Washington, D.C., with my mother's family, my cousin showed up, who appeared to be passing for white. She's married to a white man, and she had her white kids. And she showed up at one of the dinners, and I can tell that the children were confused. But in that twist, my granddaughter asked me, who were the white kids? And I said, those are your cousins. And just as kids go, they begin playing, and it was all well. So when people ask me the question that you have asked me today, what is my black experience? It's no different than your experience. We just have different skin colors and different backgrounds. You will never understand what it's like in my life to be black, nor will I understand what it is in your life to be white. Until you walk in that person's shoes, you will always be asking that question. I had a white coworker who lives here in Louisville who thought that I had a blessed life and asked me one day what it was like to be black. And then he told me over lunch that he could never live a black life because it was too hard, even though he thought I had a great life. But for me, being black, I couldn't see myself any other race. We're not different, we're just different skin colors. I love being black in America. Many people have sacrificed a lot for me to live and do the things that I do here today. I am a black American. I do things differently than white Americans because I grew up in a different life. I think it's a shame that white men in America always want to change the names, calling us colored, Negro, black, and now we're African American, but that's fine. I am a black American. I am who I was meant to be. I am a proud black American woman, and I choose to live in America. I walk with pride as a black American woman. My skin color is black. My life is black. My policies are black because I am a black woman living in America that just want equal status. Today for this discussion, we could use the James Baldwin debates of 1965, for example. I was five years old at the time, and it was in the 60s. James Baldwin said at the age of 12, he was called a nigger and was told to go back where he came from, from a New York City policeman. And here we are today, in July of 2020, talking about the same thing on how we're going to handle our Texas police and our black communities. The problems with police in America will not be resolved in these sessions here in Louisville. But we can determine what side of history we want to fall under when the history books are written about our police departments and how we address the issue here in our community. As a recent graduate of the Louisville Citizen Police Academy, class of 42, I do have some concerns. And what is my experience living in Louisville while black? This is a short and more relevant topic at hand. I was Karen recently, and do you know what it means to be Karen a Ken in 2020? It means that I had the Louisville police called on me for doing something while black, while other Louisvillians can do daily. And Chief, this disturbed me and my family, and it still has me feeling some kind of way about my community that I chose to move to 20 years ago, the community where I purchased and owned my home. But most residents in Louisville know who I am, and so for me, I felt like I was treated that way simply because of the color of my skin. So Chief, this must stop. We must discuss and remove all injustice in policing in our black community in Louisville. During these sessions, let us make changes not only for black residents, but for people of color living here in Louisville. When I saw the Louisville Police Department dressed in SWAT and military style uniforms, doing the Black Lives Matter and tear gassing our young residents at a peaceful march, I was appalled. It looked like to me it was over policing. I started out this year in 2020 as a completely different person that I stand here today. The racism I see in Louisville is disturbing. When people of color, not just black residents, look at our community leaders and do not see themselves, it hurts. 
and we believe we do not have a voice for us. When running for office here in Louisville over the past few years, I was disappointed at the acts demonstrated by our city leaders. I could sell my home and move somewhere else. I don't have any ties to North Texas, but I do not run from uncomfortable situations. As an agent of change, I want to work out ways where we can make things different. I want to leave things better than I found them. I see Louisville growing, and I understand the residents want to remain in old Louisville. But Louisville will grow. And what we need to do is determine how we want to see the growth for the betterment of Louisville residents. I would like to see us as one community living together. I would like to see our community leaders involved in our community, out in our community, and not, and not having the res residents summoned as we are here today to discuss how we feel. You and our community leaders should already know how the community feels. You should already have your finger on the pulse of this community. I trust that these sessions create change for our community. I trust that through these sessions, the city will create a much needed department of leaders to address cultural diversity. I understand that change does not happen overnight. And I understand that we as people of color in this community need change because we need to see ourselves and our leaders. But this is a great start and I thank you for having us here this evening. I'm Howard Redman. I've been in Louisville for about 18 years. Uh, I'm from Sacramento. I got about four stories, but I'll keep them short. Uh, started back in, give a story back in 99. We were in Sacramento, uh, not actually Sacramento, we went to a wedding. And we had one guy getting married. He was getting married. He just got drafted. And so a lot of his NFL players came to town. And we're going through, he's about hours from begin, getting married. And we're picking up people in the city to go to this wedding. And the officer follows us and stops us. Now you got about 21 NFL players and big, nice cars and so forth, and they're profiling us. And they're saying, what are you doing here, X, Y, Z? And they're all on the phone with their agents and, and attorneys. And now the whole neighborhood's coming out. The chief comes. Well, you guys, we can't let him out here. You just go up to the station and we'll let him out. So you're proving a point to the other people in the neighborhood that you have control. So literally, we go to the police station, they pull in, he walks right out the door. Why is that happening to a black man in America? So then, 2010, my nephew's staying with me, he goes to school over here in uh, the middle school off of uh, Bel Air. And I tell him, if you get any issues, you call me. I don't care what it is, you call me. It's on a Friday, it's at 10.30 in the morning. They said, well, he was walking in the hall during the break, he had gum in his mouth, and the teacher told him to spit the gum out, and he kept walking. Hmm. My nephew's a little hyper. So I get to the school, and I, I say, well, let's, I ask two questions. Where did he get gum from? Because I sure don't give him candy in the morning. And where's the garbage can at for him to spit? Principal's go, mm -hmm. let me walk up over there. Oh, there's no garbage can. Oh, well, the, on Fridays, the teachers let them read, and if they're quiet, they'll give them candy. Really? But you want to give him detention or expulsion because of, of this and, and you caused this problem? That's here in our schools. Second issue with my daughter. Now, you ain't going to mess with my daughter. It's an open house. She has dyslexia. She has her, her rights, the things that she's supposed to have, take pictures of what's on the board and so forth. We explain that to the math teacher. And we're trying to let our daughter be independent, so we say, hey, tomorrow you got to go tell the teacher of your, of your issues and how, what you're supposed to be, be do. Teacher tells us the night before, it's no problem. But she tells my daughter the next day, oh, it's not in your program. We can't do that. You have to take your own notes. I'm sorry, that's been in her program. She's been in fifth grade, and she's now in seventh grade. So again, the next morning, oh, I got the whole staff of the school there. Oh, so ironically, they found that whole program in there within 24 hours. So yeah, it's not just the officers, it's even in your school districts. So recently in 2014, 
Uh, you guys had off of Old Orchard, there was a police sting or whatever. You guys are monitoring traffic stops for about a year. So anybody drive down Old Orchard knows that these police officers from, from uh, Primrose, you turn off over there, up to the Phoenix gas station used to be over there, up to Fox. It's been a year. So I'm driving on a Sunday, make a ride off of Bel Air, and your officer is way far away. And before I get over to the bridge, to, to the bridge, he's out walking, trying to wave me over, telling me to pull over, telling me I'm speaking. When I get up there, he pulls me over. Oh, you, you, you pulled you over because you were speaking. There's no way in the world that after coming from a stop, turning right, and before you get to the bridge, you get up to 65 miles per hour. Ain't no way in the world. I said, well, okay, well, let me show, let me see that radar. Okay, I'll show it to you when you give me your ID. Okay. Well, you know, I tell you, I don't got to show you anything. Oh, really? Like, where's that in the law? My daughter's nervous. She said, well, if you don't give me your ID, I'm going to arrest you. Really? Over ID? I turn around, calm my daughter down. Hey, just calm down. He breaks my window. Pulls me out the car. Tell me I'm going to jail for what? Failure to show ID? I never told you I wasn't going to give you my ID. Me questioning your authority? What, what authority you have, really? Because like, you're just a peace officer, and I'm asking you, show me evidence that you say I was speeding. I know there's no way I could have been speeding, and y'all been on this block for almost a year. So I gotta, I'm 40 years old going to jail for the first time in my life over what? Not showing an ID, but when you read the police report, I read it two weeks ago when I met with you. Oh, his, his whole story is totally opposite of what, what really happened. So not only do you affect me, but now when I go pick my daughter up and I get out of school the next day, yeah, Dad, I don't, yeah, Dad, I don't even want to get in the car with you. I would just walk home. To this day, if an officer comes behind me, my wife, or drives along the sign, hey, Dad, slow down, Dad, just slow, slow down. So it's not that you're affecting us, you're affecting our kids. So I didn't even want to come to even share these stories, but I, I'm looking at now, I got to look at the, the next generation. But you want to say, what can you do? How about some de-escalation? Because that whole incident is even recorded. He escalated everything. So am I wrong asking for evidence that you said I was speeding when I know I wasn't? When you, if you had the radar, why it's in your hand, why show me the radar? So it's not even to your officers and it's your school districts. Good evening, everyone. How is everyone doing tonight? Good evening. I'm stand up like Winston did. Is that okay? Because it's hard for me to talk sitting down. But anyway, I noticed my name is not on the sheet, and I'm familiar with a lot of people in here, but there's some new faces that I don't know, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Tamala Bowie. I moved here from Oklahoma in 1985, but I moved to Louisville in 1991. I own two businesses. Um, I have an insurance agency that's in Farmers Branch, and I also have my own interior design agency that is in um, Addison, Texas. And also, I'm a dual licensed insurance agent, a certified paralegal, and an award-winning interior designer. So, with all that being said, how am I, as a black woman, in the United States of America? So let me go back to my childhood, and I put some little notes on here because I have a tendency to ramble. I like to talk. When I have an audience, it's, it's going to make me want to talk more, so I want to try to stay on course. But anyway, so I grew up in Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City in an affluent suburb called Forest Park. I was raised by my grandparents up until age 15. Now, I grew up in a unique um, household because my grandfather, when he was probably about 18 or 19 years old, he worked as a cook at the Skirvin Hotel in downtown Oklahoma City. So he was working back then when things were segregated and, you know, all the 
the abhorrent things that we know that happened back then. So he made it his life's mission to start his own business so that way none of his children or grandchildren or any of his generations will have to work for what he would say, the man. Now, I'm embarrassed to say this, but my grandfather was prejudiced. He did not like white people. So for 15 years, this is what I heard growing up. There were no racial slurs being said in this affliction household. We lived in a 4,500 square foot home out in Forest Park, but the black people that lived, because that was a predominantly black suburb, we were bused over to the white schools in the other suburbs, because they wanted the tax dollars that came out of the affluent neighborhood. So even though my grandfather was prejudiced, he didn't use racial slurs. We just had it embedded into our head, you do not marry outside your race, no white people were allowed to the house. The only white friends that I had were friends at school, and we could not go and spend the night at anybody's house who wasn't black. So for 15 years, you could say that I was indoctrinated with prejudice. Okay, and it was hard as a black girl going to a predominantly, or rather all white school, didn't hardly see anybody, you know, like me. And so quite naturally you gravitate or you start to imitate who you are around the most. And so for then, all my 15 years when I was living there, this is what I knew. Now, during that time, I was sort of kind of shielded from, from racism because of where we lived, and we lived on three acres, and we didn't want for anything, so I didn't really have to deal with a lot of the, some, a lot of the things that some of the other black kids uh, had to deal with that grew up on the other side, what they say the other side of the tracks. And I remember when I went and visited a cousin over in another part of Oklahoma City, it was me and my other three cousins, we were outside playing, and this was the first time at, I think it was probably like nine years old, we were playing in the street, and it was um, a truck that had three white people in it, and we are just playing kickball in the street, and they drove by and they waved. So we're like, hey, so we wave back. And they start picking up speed, and then they yelled out the window, niggers, and took off. And so we're like, where did that come from? We thought they were being friendly just by waving, so we waved back. But anyway, so that's, that was the first time. So in 1985, um, my mom married my stepdad, and we moved down here to Texas. So we ended up living in Irving, Texas. And that's when Irving, Texas was probably like 99% white. So again, I'm right back into the same atmosphere where I'm um, only the you know, black family in the neighborhood and everything like that and going to predominantly white schools. And so we ended up living in an apartment when we moved to Irving. And so that particular apartment complex, it fed into MacArthur High School. And so at MacArthur High School, it was a, I graduated in 1988, and in 1988, it was probably about what? 12 blacks that graduated in the class of 900 at MacArthur High School. And I remember back then, it was though there were interracial couples, but that's, that's when I sort of kind of understood what racism was, racism was about because when we would have our dances, the black and the white couples, they could fast dance, but they were not, they were not allowed to slow dance. So if you were an interracial couple, you could do, you know, whatever the fast dance was, but when a slow uh, song came on, you could slow dance, but you had to slow dance without embracing the other person where the black and black couple could embrace or the white and white couple could embrace. And I was like, hmm, that sort of kind of, you know, that was different, but I was like, okay, that's, that's how it was going to be. And that's how it was. And then I remember there was a black guy, his name was Reggie Finch, and he was dating one of the popular white girls at school, and they were getting into an argument down the hallway, and he had hit the locker, and she, you know, I guess she started crying, and some of the white guys from the uh, football team came over there and was getting ready to beat him up. So we almost had a race riot that started right there at MacArthur High School, and some of the white football players started um, chanting, bring back segregation, bring uh, back segregation. So now, if you remember, I told you I grew up 15 years, 
hearing my grandfather say, okay, I don't like white people, blah, 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 blah. And so now I'm starting to see all this, but I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let that harden my heart because, you know, I'm, I just don't want to be that person like my grandfather was. And so even at MacArthur High School, even though we didn't have a lot of blacks that were there, my experience at the high school was that a lot of the counselors, they just felt that the few blacks that were there, they sort of kind of pushed us to go towards technical schools or cosmetology or, uh, or some of the trade schools and not really want to talk to us about being college bound. And so coming from watching my grandfather be a successful business entrepreneur, having some of my aunts and uncles uh, being attorneys and doctors, I knew that I was, you know, destined to be something great, just not going to a trade school. So I took it up on myself to learn all that I needed to know to get into college because the counselors at, Mac at MacArthur High School, they wouldn't call down the seniors who were black to ask them, what are some of your... Um, ambitious uh, um, things you want to do after high school? Are you planning to go to college? So I ended up getting into the University of Texas at Arlington. And during my college years, I really didn't experience a lot of racism, I guess because they say, what, college is very liberal, so everybody is all embracing each other and you are meeting people from all different walks of life. So I really didn't experience any racism, at least not any overt racism. It could have been systematic, I don't know, but I didn't experience any personal overt racism when I was in college. So when I graduated, I graduated with my bachelor's in political science with my minor in criminal justice. And at that time, they were also, um, we were also able to get our certification to become a paralegal. So I obtained that certification as well. So I was excited. That was going to be my first step towards going to law school. I was going to work as a paralegal for a little while. And so my resume was fabulous. And I started sending the resumes off to all these law firms in downtown Dallas. And when I was sending the resume that same day, I get a phone call back. And yeah, we want to set you up for an interview and everything like that. And I'm like, oh, cool. I said, this is going to be easy to land a job. And I remember this uh, still sticks in my head because it was a law firm. I'm not going to say the name. I put on my power navy blue suit. You know, back in the day, you wear your suits when you go to the interviews. And that's what I did. I put on my navy suit, my heels, made sure my nails were on point, you know, had my hair, my makeup all together. So when I walked through the doors, there was the receptionist. And I walk up there with my briefcase and I said, yes, my name is Tamala Bowie and I have an 11 o'clock interview with blank blank. And she goes, should, I mean, you should have seen the look on her face. And she looks and she goes, oh, 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 okay, just one minute. So I'm sitting down, I'm like, yeah, you know. So he comes out, he said, oh, nice to meet you, Miss Bowie. Let's go right here into this office. That was the quickest five minute interview that I had, very quick. Okay, and we all know the reason why that interview was quick, okay? And so he's like, yeah, well, I'm gonna give you a call back and I knew there wasn't gonna be a call back because I only had the opportunity to tell him my name is Tamala Bowie, I live a boom, 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 and that was it. So I get back home and my husband is biracial, he's Spanish, well, he's a little bit of everything. And so I tell him, I said, I don't understand why I can't secure a job. I get a phone call back, um, from the interviews the same day, I go on the interviews and I just don't understand. So I call my aunt, she is an attorney that had practiced here in Texas, then she moved back to California. And I was like, Aunt Monta, I've, I've been sending resumes, I get the phone calls back, but I'm not getting these jobs. She's like, give me some of the law firms where you are um, sending them to. So I start telling her, she says, sweetie, those are Republican law firms. I said, so what does that have to do with anything? She said, some of them are racist, some of them are not. But it's their clients that they're concerned about. Their clients don't feel comfortable with the black paralegal working their cases. And I was like, damn, okay. So I said, okay, new career change, you know, and everything like that. So that was sort of kind of humbling for me. And then it, it, it started going, oh, I'm sorry, I said a bad word on the thing. Oh, y'all can bleep that out. I'm sorry. Bleep it out. <laughs> so anyway, 
I was like, okay, it's time for a career change after that. And so my husband, he doesn't look, I mean, he looks Spanish. And on some occasions, because he's bald-headed, he can pass for Caucasian. And so he really didn't understand what I was coming from when I was saying, oh, you know, I'm, this has to be, I mean, I don't know what's going on. I mean, they're just not hiring me because I'm black. But when he saw it over and over and over again, he really started to understand. And then I started thinking back, so this is what my grandfather was saying, the reason why he wanted us to be our own boss so we wouldn't have to deal with that. So now, fast forward, as a black woman, a black businesswoman in Louisville, well, not, well, live in Louisville, but I have businesses in other cities, I'm glad I didn't take on the thoughts that my grandfather had. Because I feel as though that racism is a spiritual deficiency, okay? And I honestly believe that everybody is talking about a change. Do you want a change or do you want a chance? And I say that to black people, do we want a change or a chance? I want a change. I don't want a chance because I can create my own opportunity. Because systematic racism is not a virus. Systematic racism is not a program that designed itself. Systematic racism was put in place by people that have a spiritual deficiency. They have evil in their heart. So that's the reason why I say I want a change, not a chance, because it has to be a change of the heart that's going to change. And we can implement all these great things, but if there is no change of heart, it's not going to change anything. Every, all, we can put in programs in place to combat this, but it's not going to be effective. There's not a change of heart. Now, the second time I was called the N-word, I was minding my own business because I live off of Valley Ridge. Like, I can walk out of my house and be in Flyer Mound in less than a minute. So I'm, I normally walk down to Marcus, and I normally walk back. On my way back, coming into Louisville, I'm minding my own business, trying to stay in shape. And this white truck passed by with this white guy in the truck, and I'm just doing fast walking, trying to make sure I'm getting my steps in. Nigger! And so I was like, I, I turned around because I'm like, I know you're talking to me because I'm both. And so I said, you know what? He didn't say that. He said something else. He said something else. So I kept on walking, but then my spirit was vexed because I'm like, I wasn't doing anything but just minding my own business. So I get home and I, t I go to, uh, in, in, to the kitchen where my husband is cooking. And I said, you know what? I said, I was called a nigger. When I was outside walking, minding my own business, I said, and I told him, I said, that was the first time, because I forgot about it when I was a child. I said, that was the first time I was ever called a nigger. And you know what my husband said? No, it wasn't. That was just the first time it was said to your face. Okay? And that stung. Okay? That really stung. So, like I said, at the end of the day, I appreciate the efforts that's put forth here because this has been long overdue. I hate that it had to take a man on national TV to lose his life in eight minutes for this conversation to come about. But like I said, we have to ask ourselves, do we want change or chance? As an award-winning interior designer, and I, and I say that because that's a new accolade that I received, so I'm going to use it to the fullest, okay? But I see even our, in our interior design industry where the systematic racism is going on. And a lot of our white designers are starting to reach out and see. But see, they're offering just a chance. I'm not looking for a chance. I can create my own opportunity. I need there for there to be a change. Okay? And that's something that we have to ask ourselves. Do we want change or do we want chance? I want to change. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Fumi Wonkolo and uh, I'm a teacher at LHS Harmon. Um, I'm really happy to be included here and uh, I'm just gonna get into it. So, um, I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to read my bio, but this is relevant to the answering the question. Um, I'm Nigerian American. My dad is Nigerian, my mother is African American, she's from Alabama. Um, but I was raised in Nigeria, 
I was born in the States, raised in Nigeria. Being raised in Nigeria, I never knew what the word minority meant. Um, Cause we're all black. Um, there, because of the fault of human nature and you know just the evilness that is in man, even when you're all black, you can find isms to discriminate against each other. So there are things that people discriminate against, but as far as seeing somebody and deciding you're less than, that doesn't happen in Nigeria. It's based on some other things. So um, growing up in Nigeria, you know, I kind of grew up with a confidence in myself, and if you know Africans, you probably see it. Um, I moved to the States to go to college in 96. I went to Hampton University, and uh, it's an HBCU. And I remember showing my roommate, I used to carry some Nigerian currency in my wallet just to kind of remember home, and I remember showing my roommate the Nigerian currency, it's called Naira, and uh, she just stopped cold. And I was like, what? I was like, it's because it's colorful, right? Because all of our notes are different colors. So I'm like, she must be excited because it's colorful. But she's like, no, they're black. The person on the money is black. And I was like, it never even occurred to me that this would be a big deal. But that was kind of my real life introduction into what it's like to be an African American. Because being an African American, a lot of times you aren't, you aren't told that you're enough by society. Your family will tell you you're enough but your experiences often tell you that you're not enough. And your family will tell you, you gotta be better than everybody else just to get any, any leg in the door. Um, and that was my introduction to that. I, I thank God that I was able to go from Nigeria where I wasn't the minority to Hampton again where I wasn't the minority because I feel like it kind of just built me up. Um, when I left Hampton, I moved to Chicago and then eventually got to Texas when I got married. Um, so my, my experience as a black person in America, um, sorry, I was putting down some notes here, is that when you're, when you're black in America, and I think this affects men more so than women, but us too, it's like you get this subconscious thing where you have to learn to be non-threatening like you have to learn to carry yourself in a non-threatening way so that the people that aren't like you, the people that aren't black will feel comfortable around you. They will trust you. They will you know, befriend you. They will respect you. My husband, he's six foot three. He's a big dude. But he says that he often jokes that he's, he's a big reader too. He says that he walks, he walks around our neighborhood holding his Kindle and wearing his glasses and just walks. And he says the fact that he wears glasses and is reading all the time kind of makes people feel at ease. If he takes his glasses off and he puts his Kindle down and he's just taking a walk, they look at him differently. Um, and I just, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Um, my brothers are also six feet tall, big guys. Uh, I go to stores with them and people follow them around Sometimes they follow me around, but they follow them around more. I worry about them every day. They, my whole family lives in Atlanta, and my dad and my brothers, they own a car dealership, and they're licensed gun owners. So they, they carry. Um, I worry about that because you hear the stories of police pulling over black men, even though they have a license to carry, and the minute they see something, they get nervous. Meanwhile, sometimes you'll see, I mean, I was driving down just over here, Main Street and Old Orchard one day, and I saw a guy with a, I guess it was a machine gun, <laughs> some kind of semi-automatic machine gun with a poster sign, a white guy just saying, you can't take away my guns. And nobody was bothering him. I felt threatened <laughs> driving. I, I called the police, the non-emergency police line. I was like, there's a guy out here with a machine gun. And they're like, well, he can do that. He's not pointing at anybody, so it's okay. But we know. <laughs> I know, I know. So, so I said, okay, all right. I'm just not going to drive that way back because <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere near that. And whereas when you see, when a lot of times you see a black man, like my brothers and my dad, I don't want them to, I don't want them to carry it on their hip, even though they have a license. I don't want somebody to see them in a the wrong way. It scares me. Um, 
my experience in in Louisville, uh, I feel like God has blessed me and protected me. I haven't had a lot of experiences with racism against me personally, at least the ones that I know of, kind of like you said with your husband. <laughs> um, nothing at least to my face, uh, but I see it. Um, my, my kids go to school here in Louisville area too. And my son, he's six, he's about to be seven, he's our youngest. Actually, this, this story is about my daughter. She's about to be 10. And sh she was going to a school um, in Louisville, but near Flower Mound. And uh, she was on the playground one day. And she, she's sensitive. So some girls didn't want to give her a ball she wanted to play with, so she started crying. This was after school at the ESD program. So she, the ESD teacher came over, he's like, why are you crying? So she's explaining to the teacher what was wrong. And then this little boy comes up, he's probably five or six is what she said, and he's a white boy. And he says, he just comes and he says, I know why she's crying. And everybody looks at him because they know he wasn't involved in this thing at all. And he says, she's crying because she has brown skin. And this is like a little five or six year old kid. And he had no idea that what he was saying was wrong. Well, that there was a problem with that. But everybody was like, whoa. I mean, the ESD teacher, he's a young white man. He immediately, when I picked them up, he told me the story himself before my daughter could tell me. He said he was gonna talk to the parents and talk to the kid and all this stuff, and he, he did. But I'll never forget that story, and I don't think my daughter will either, because why is a five-year-old kid saying that? He, he, the only place he could learn that from is his parents. Um, and that makes me sad. Uh, in, my, in teaching in schools, I used to teach in Irving, I used to teach in Emmett's actually, I'm sure you're familiar, but I teach at LHS Harmon. Um, there's a book titled, why, why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together? And I haven't read it yet, but one of my friends who's a psychologist in this area has told me about it and they're reading it as a study. She's a psych psychologist in LISD. Uh, but off the bat, off the, do off the dome, I could tell you why the black kids are sitting together. It's because they're sitting with people that they know, that they feel like they can trust easier. They feel like this person, I can talk to them and they're not gonna think of me as other. I feel like in, in America, we're, we're, thought, we're taught to be non-threatening, but we're also, we have this thing where when we meet, and I won't speak for everybody, I'll just speak for myself, but I feel like when I meet white people, when I get in a place where, and I go to a diverse church, I'm, I live in a diverse area, but I feel like there's a split second where I have to think to myself, are they gonna like me for me, or are they, do they have some prejudice in them that I need to consider? Um, oftentimes, it's, it's the latter. Sorry, it's the former. You know, they like me for me. Um, but for that split second, I have to wonder about it. Like, is this gonna be one of the good ones? Or will I know? Um, and that's something that being in America has taught me. It's not something that I grew up with in Nigeria. It's something that I, I you know, some people flee this country because of that, because they don't want to deal with it anymore. One of my best friends, her brother, 6'6", six, six, he went to college in, I wanna say Iowa, I might be misquoting, but it's a place that wasn't very diverse. He could have stayed here in the States, but he left and moved back to Nigeria because he said he got tired of people following him, people treating him badly, police mistreating him. He doesn't know how black men can stay here. So he just moved back to Nigeria. Um, a lot of people don't have that option. A lot of people don't wanna move. They just want to make this place better, and, and I think that's a great thing, and I'm very happy for this opportunity to share with you and to, that you guys created this commission. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. I've been telling people ever since this George Floyd thing, and even before, that the more times we can get in a room together as friends or as colleagues or as just people that want to share with one another, black people, white people, all types of people, this is where we make the change because fighting on the internet doesn't do it. People just sit in their corners and dig in. But when we can get in front of each other, and this is even amongst friends. Like I've seen some of my church people say some things I think are crazy on Facebook. But I'm like, if we could sit in a room together, we could probably come to kind of some kind of middle ground here. I could understand you more, you could understand me more. So that's why I think this commission is wonderful. Um, 
yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. So hi, my name is Jocelyn McMurray. And again, I'm originally from Detroit. I um, moved here maybe um, 20, 25 years ago. Living as a black woman living in the um, United States, I wanted to talk about for just a moment how when I was a child, we would go to Mississippi and it was our duty as grandchildren to teach my grandmother the Star Spangled Banner, the um, Pledge of Allegiance, those types of things so that she could be prepared to vote. Because in 1960, she could not vote in Mississippi. And so every time they would have a test. And so we, our jobs as kids were to teach her so that she would be able to pass that test. 1964 was the first time she was able to vote. And it was a life changer for all of us. And if anyone knows me now, they know that I'm passionate about voting. And so you'll see me knocking on doors, and I'm that person that's coming around telling you when the municipal votes are, when it's going on, because we have a terrible voting record here. So we don't know who we are, who we represent, because as a state, we don't vote. So um, when I went to high school, and I went to a Catholic high school in Detroit, so again, it was very, very diverse. And I graduated the year of the infamous Detroit riot. So all of a sudden, you know, these things are happening, and I go away to college, to the University of uh, uh, Northern Michigan University, and that's when I started hitting racism. Because living in Detroit at that time, there was Motown, there was all these things going on. You didn't really notice what was happening, but you noticed it when you went to Mississippi, and things were different. Well, when I went to Northern Michigan, I remember being in a suite with, it was two suites, in the middle, the people in, on the other side, they would actually get up early in the morning and clean the bath, go to the bathroom, clean the bathroom before we, the, the black sweet mates, would use it because they didn't want to use it behind us. And, you know, you look at it and you go like, seriously, I wouldn't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to do that, but they would. And we would say, well, we'll offer to, you know, take turns cleaning the bathroom. They didn't want any parts of that. Oh, we'll do it but it was because they didn't like being part of the suite with us and sharing that. And so you grow through up and you know that and you understand that and finally maybe after by the end of the semester we became friends because we had made up in our minds that we weren't going to let that stop us. They wanted to clean the bathroom up, Shh, let them do it. <laughs> you know, we didn't care. So Years later, after I was working for the bank, and I was working for Comerica Bank, I came to Texas, and wow, what a, ch what a change. <laughs> it was wild. But it wasn't so much wild as being black as it was being female. Because all of a sudden, you know, I'm coming here as a vice president, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, what is going on? I remember going to one of the IT companies to buy about $4 million worth of servers, and the company wouldn't deal with me. They told me to bring my, you know, bring my boss back. And I had to end up going to another company in Houston to buy these servers that I needed to do. Just stupid, stupid stuff for no reason or for just, you're just not even thinking about it. But the other part of living in Texas and living in Louisville is that I raised my son to be careful to make sure that he put both hands on the wheel if someone stopped him, to make sure he had his license together, all those different things. And the thing that's so tragic to me now, and the reason it's so tragic is because most of these guys are being killed, have done nothing. They've, you know, they've been, been handcuffed, hands behind their back, they're not struggling, they're not fighting, they're not cussing at anyone. They're doing what we as moms told them to do. And they're still dying. And it's very, very, very scary. Now, I do also want to mention that once when my granddaughter was two, on college, coming from 2499, I pulled over and stopped at a playground. Just because it had something over there that my granddaughter, what I wanted her to see. And the police came up to me in Flower Mound and asked me, did I live there? And when I showed them that I lived in Louisville, 
They told me, well, you really shouldn't be in this, playing in this playground. My granddaughter was two. What could I possibly do to that equipment for a two-year-old? And when I looked at him and I told him, I said, you know, seriously? <laughs> you know, I've got this degree, I've got this, I work in corporate America, and I can't take my, my two-year-old to play in a playground? Unflipping believable. But those are the things that happen driving around thinking that you're okay, but you're black. People can do that and think they can do it and it's okay. Um, I do want to also mention, though, that when I stand in these things, um, I just turned 70, and I'm standing up here and doing these things at Black Lives Matter in Flower Mound and Louisville. I shouldn't have to do this again. I did it. Been there, done that. But I do appreciate the fact that you guys are at least listening and asking us the questions, because it's important. I also want to give the chief um, a note that when we did have the, the march in Louisville, I didn't walk it. I just went up to the, to the high school, and when I knew what they were going to do, I just came back. But I did appreciate that you took the time to get on YouTube and, you know, and talk about what happened with the rest of the people that did that. That speaks volumes. Because a lot of my neighbors and stuff were, you know, they were, my, all my white neighbors around there were very concerned that all of a sudden I'm going out here doing these marches and everything. But it was very, very important that I think that you guys st stood there and gave an explanation as to what happened. So it's very important and it's also something that we just have got to do. We've got to communicate and we've got to talk and understand each other. And that's all I just had to say. Awesome. Um, is it necessary for me to stand to speak, or can you? I, I get to stand and speak quite often, and so I'm going to take the opportunity to sit this time. Um, my name is Anthony Cox. I'm the pastor of Relevant Life Church here in Louisville in Old Town, and um, It's not, it's not very often that I'm, I'm actually nervous about speaking, but tonight I, I think it's because I sense uh, the weight of this moment. It's a responsible moment. I agree with you, Mama, that I've done this a number of times. Um, I count it an honor to be able to speak to this group tonight, but I've had this conversation a number of times. I'm currently uh, speaking to a number of groups and having these kinds of dialogue. My youngest son is 22, and uh, he charged me up. He said, Dad, you've got to know that many of these groups are asking for you to speak because they think you're safe. They like you. You've done what it takes to not be threatening. But you also owe the truth. I pastor a very diverse group of folks black, white, Hispanic, various ages, socioeconomic status, and it's a challenge. And it's a challenge that I love because I, I feel like I was created for this time, as we have been. And um, it's challenging as we try to grow together towards aligning with truth but we've got a long way to go in our congregation we have um, we have folks that will wear a MAGA hat and are fully behind our president and believe that he is God's man for this hour and we also have people that don't get them started talking. 
because they will tell you how insane it is that we've elected this man as our president. And we have everybody in between. And as I said, we're all on a course trying to align ourselves with truth. And so I'm happy to just keep everybody together to learn from one another and to draw from one another's experiences until we can align with truth. I, uh, I grew up a product of uh, the South, North Central Texas, or North Central Florida, rather. And um, I'm, I'm one of those products of the desegregation movement. Up until my third grade year, I went to an all-black elementary school. Um, it, was, it was the only world I knew. It was all black. My community, my neighborhood was all black. Our doctors and lawyers were all black. Our businessmen, the people that worked on our cars, the people that did the lawns, if it wasn't the little boys like myself, they were all black. We were a self-sufficient community. I walked to school safely with my relatives, my cousins, my friends and neighbors. And when I got to the school, my mom had already been there for probably an hour and a half because she was the school secretary. She was educated and she worked as the right hand to the principal. So he was not threatening to me. Yes, he was black. In third grade, our world got turned upside down because they began bringing little white boys and girls from a part of our city that they couldn't possibly have walked to this school. But we were forced to integrate. And I watched them day after day get off the bus with fear in their eyes because they were coming into an all black environment. One of the um, impactful relationships for me was a little boy by the name of Mike Coyle. And because of the close spellings of our last names, he and I stood in lines together. We sat in classrooms together and we became friends. And um, I had the opportunity to speak up for him because he was being bullied for no other reason than the color of his skin. And I got to tell my friends and those who respected me, hey, leave him alone. He's, he's a good guy. He's a good kid. And we grew over the next three years to respect one another, we walked around with marbles in our pockets, shaking. Some of you remember those kinds of times. Um, it was a fun time with him. I remember one, one life-changing situation where my mom allowed me to go home with Mike Coyle after school and visit his home. <laughs> I had not really been out of the black neighborhood Mike had horses at his house. Mike had a mini bike. And I thought to myself, oh my God, white people are awesome. They have the greatest life and I want to share. <laughs> In sixth grade, my world changed again because now it was flipped to where I had to go literally across the tracks and to the other side of town. And it was me that was the minority in a predominantly white and upper class school. So I know what you're talking about, Ms. Bowie. Um, 
it was not always safe for me to ride my bike to the other side of town. There were racial slurs and things that I hope my children and grandchildren don't have to endure. And it was in middle school that I started getting separated from my community. And it was along the lines of, huh, we have one here that seems to test well. He's mannerable. He's probably safe. We can train him up. And because of my academics, um, I was invited to take part in classes that, yeah, I was the only one. And though I did well academically, there were still limitations and I was still made to know what those limitations were. Uh, I wanna fast forward because I don't wanna take everybody's time I was hired by IBM before I graduated college and that was an identity to assume. It was to be an IBMer and to have that badge. When I went to the hospital or to the doctor, I didn't even have to show them my insurance card it was just here's my badge you, you you need to take care of whatever i've got going on it was a proud thing until about two years into my employment with ibm and my second line manager had a um an interview with me and he shared with me that <laughs> anthony i i, I had to take my hat off to you because Honestly, I didn't think you would make it. The group that you were hired with, you were supposed to wash out the credentials and the, the paper that they came in with is far superior to your credentials. And quite frankly, when we hired you, we needed your skin color but we thought you would wash out of the system. Well, I didn't. And fortunately for me, someone took me under their wings who happened to be black and happened to be upper line. And so I was very fortunate. And um, I was, at the age of 26, I moved, IBM moved me here from Tampa, Florida. And my wife and I, bought a house in Flower Mound, Texas. Um, we weren't smart enough to do it because of the educational system or because Flower Mound was gonna be up and coming. It was, when we bought our house, there were still reeds blowing in the wind and cows on the other side of the road. And it was, you know, a few years later that it was all two-story homes around us instead. Now, we, we, as a matter of fact, when we moved here, the real estate agent, even knowing that IBM was paying for my move, always took us to Duncanville, to Soto. They took us south. <laughs> and I was telling someone today that my wife shares that in some of the neighborhoods where we were taken, she said, I, I ain't getting out of this car. I'm scared to be here. I'm not, I don't care what it looks like inside. I'm not living here. And it was on a weekend that we just happened to be driving around ourselves and trying to discover this new nation of Texas that we had moved to. And we came across this little settlement of IBM or of uh, Flower Mound and we found a home that was suitable for us and was still in the building stage and it worked out for us. 
our children at the time, we only had two. We had a three-year-old daughter and an 18-month-old son. And we didn't plan it, but God had plans. Uh, we moved into a home that uh, my daughter became uh, part of the first class that graduated after going through the entire school. So it was a new school. And then she also had the uh, the distinct honor of being in the first class that graduated from Flower Mound High after going through all of the grades. Um, there are plenty of negative stories to be shared, and, and I'm not going to monopolize the time by telling you all of mine. There are stories that we're going to get to from some of the rest of you tonight. Um, I, I want to share my perspective of, well, I will share this one. In the first six months of us living in Flower Mound, I was a, I was a manager of a shift of um, computer operators and in the first six months, driving from Irving to our home in Flower Mound, I was stopped three times. Um, I covered second and third shifts, so I, I would get off work two, three in the morning. And I was, eh, I was a little cocky. At 26, a um, couple years earlier, we had bought our first Cadillac, and I had it with Trues and Vogues and um, Cadillac grill, and I made sure it stayed shiny. I came from Florida, but I had a full-length, double-breasted black leather uh, coat for the winter. And so driving home from work, I was stopped three times by uh, police officers in Capel. And the, the, the narrative went something like this each time. Where are, you, where are you going? I'm going home. And where's home? Flower Mound. Mm-hmm. And where are you coming from? Work. And where's work? IBM. Mm-hmm. From a positive perspective, uh, after my career with IBM and after doing several other things, um, I have been the owner and operator of a fence business um, and just to kind of give a sense of the of the environment and the thinking, and and I've shared this. I've had the opportunity to speak to the police uh, training. Uh, so yes, uh, Chief Dever, I appreciate getting a chance to see you here tonight as well. And uh, I've shared this with the officers that. Um, my 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 team my contractors had a thing about working in Highland Village Flower Mound. Boss, we ain't working past five, maybe six, but we out of here well before dark. Okay. But there was a sense of relief just getting to the Louisville line. There was a difference. It's, it's, we're, we'll be okay. You know, even if we get stopped, it ain't gonna be like being in Flower Mound or Highland Village, okay? Uh, but I'd like to turn the remaining portion of my time to an experience that I, I, would, I would like for us to consider how we might approach going forward. And this is that my, my children 
by virtue of the fact that my wife and I stumbled onto this house in Flower Mound and didn't take them to Duncanville and DeSoto. And I, I am not trying to cast a pall uh, over those uh, areas, but uh, our five children went through the Flower Mound school system um, and all but our youngest son graduated from Flower Mound High. Our youngest son graduated at Byron Nelson. Um, they've all been t to college. Two of our children were, um, were national merit scholars. And that afforded them the opportunity to go to any university they wanted to. And they chose Baylor. <laughs> well, um, my youngest daughter was the last of those two, and she graduated in 2011. And the year she graduated, I, I, I thought the number was 31 scholars at Flower Mound High, but I, I went back and I began to check some statistics and Flower Mound boasts that it was 26, not 31. Um, so I think the 31 was semi-finalist, but of them, 26 were f national merit finalists. And that year, I believe Marcus graduated 15, 17 finalists. Hebron graduated five. Louisville graduated one. The colony did not make the scoreboard. And that bothers me. I live in Louisville now, and I pastor predominantly people that live in Louisville, and I care for our children, and I care for their future. And that, to me, is a statistic that is unbearable. It's not right, and we need to change at the root what is the result, okay? And you say, well, maybe that was an aberration. Okay, so, so I, I looked up this year's statistics for the class of 2020. LISD graduated 63 National Merit finalists. I think that's awesome. But what I think is atrocious is that 37 of them came from Flower Mound High School. So things haven't changed. 15 of them were from Marcus High School. Nine from Hebron, one from Louisville High School, one from the colony. Now, if that's not a mark of systemic problems, I don't, I don't know what is. Because education is supposed to be one of the silver bullets that begins to close the gap It's supposed to make things more equal for us to have the chance. But if we haven't changed at the fundamental roots, then we have no chance. And so I close with the challenge for us to think in terms of how, what are we going to do uh, to continue to increase the chances of this young lady over here. Yeah. Louisville graduate. Yes. Amen. I yield the floor. Hello. Just me. 
testing? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening to everyone, and um, I want to thank uh, the mayor and the staff for inviting us to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Linda Bugs. I'm representing uh, Macedonia Ministries, 702 South Mill Street, Louisville, Texas, Pastor T.J. Denson. And forgive me, I thought my phone was on mute, and uh, he called about something, so I'll have to call him when I get off. <laughs> um, I've been in Texas since 1978. I, uh, I grew up in Arkansas. Um, first eight years of my life, well, until I was in the eighth grade, I lived on a farm with my grandparents uh, in a little town southeast of Pine Bluff, um, 80 acres, cotton, um, outdoor toilets, uh, pick cotton, chop cotton, so I know all about the, the bare bones, the, the farm life. I grew up. Uh, and, and I'll say through my life, God has blessed me. I've traveled across many countries, um, Europe, Asia. Um, but I remember my humble beginnings. And that's how I was raised and how I've tried to live and how I raised my children. Um, I experienced two, um, I guess, situations of protest. Um, my last year in high school, we integrated, and we were not happy. We were ready for our prom, and you know, we just wanted to do our own thing. Um, and then my last year in college, um, we merged with the University of Arkansas, and. Um, we actually protested. I was in the band, so we went to the Capitol in Little Rock and marched. And that was my first opportunity, I guess, to really be involved in a protest. I mean, although, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, all that had happened prior, but uh, that was new for me. But it was important. Um, now, as I look back on it, it was something that needed to change. And we really, um, benefited from it. Uh, I moved to Illinois from uh, graduating from college, uh, worked for State Farm Insurance Company 41 years. I retired in 2016. Um, many different uh, positions. Uh, my experience is mostly accounting business. I, um, again, have a degree in accounting, but I had leadership teams, so it was uh, birth and leadership. Um, but I managed our credit union. I had budgets, millions of dollars. So again, my background is, is business and money. Uh, and even in our church, I'm director of finance, uh, was director of finance, I'm director of administration currently, but did our payroll. So again, just continually working in the business aspect and um, accounting. Um, I have two daughters. Um, they attended Blossom Valley and uh, Temple Christian Academy initially, and they wanted to go to private, I mean, public school, but I lived in Lake Dallas when we first moved out here. That was where we bought our first home, and um, they wanted to go to public school, and they did good. They thrived. Um, my oldest daughter moved fast forward. She's... Um, Dr. Michelle Bugs, and she is Associate Dean at uh, Collin County Community. She worked at TWU for a couple of years, but uh, got a promotion last year. Uh, my youngest is Casey, and uh, she's an electrical engineer with Lockheed Martin, uh, master's in uh, engineering. Uh, she worked, uh, moved to Japan for a couple of years. Uh, currently, she's in Santa Barbara and uh, doing well. Um, but I taught them, again, exposed them to my humble beginnings. We still own the farm, and so occasionally, you know, we, we would go down and visit, and we talk about, you know, how things really were. My great-grandmother was married to a Caucasian white man. Um, so, you know, I was raised not really... Um, understanding uh, then, you know, 
what it really meant. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, currently is dating a Caucasian man, and I've had to adjust my thinking. Um, but the important thing is that, you know, if they love each other and take care of one another. Um, so I, I've had different experiences. I had to prove myself, as many of you said, on my job. Uh, I earned everything I got from hard work, getting in there, rolling up my sleeves. But at times it was humbling to have to feel like, you know, you had to do more than everyone else did to make it. Um, there are a lot of things that we as, as black employees experience that I won't go into. But the thing that brought us and got us through was that we stuck together. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I started out with a group of individuals and in, over 50 years ago, uh, close to 50, and we're very close. We do Zoom calls, we travel, but we supported one another. And that's what got us through a lot of the experiences and the things that we had to go through. Um, I've never personally experienced uh, any brutality or um, some of the things that have been mentioned by the police or law enforcement until recently. Um, and it was probably the week after Memorial Weekend, and I say experience it wasn't me personally, but my nephew lives with me. And um, right before the COVID stuff broke out, he his car was hit, and um, basically the front part was torn, the fender was torn off, and so uh, he had gotten with the insurance company, they settled and he'd gotten the money, had to order the parts, and by that time, the COVID hit and everything shut down, so he couldn't get his car fixed. So it's just, you know, he could drive it, but he was sitting in on the street in front of my house. Um, and so it was a Tuesday, I believe, and I was in the house getting ready, taking a shower, I had a doctor's appointment. And he had been outside, he forgot something, he'd opened the car, and went back in to get something in the house, and when he went back outside, the police were out there searching his car. And he asked them, you know, what were they looking for? What was the problem? Uh, his mother, uh, who lives in Pine Bluff, is a CSI. She's a crime scene investigator for the police department. So she has had the talk with him and told him what to do and what not to do and what to say. So he understood how to um, approach and talk the language. Um, they never asked for his ID. They never asked for his proof of insurance. They never really told him why they were looking in his car. And uh, he asked them if he was being detained and they said yes. Um, and in a couple of minutes, they just left. So it kind of bothered me, and I was trying to determine if it was Louisville or Carrollton, because I live in an addition right north of Castle Hills. And so uh, sometimes Carrollton police does come through there, but I believe it's, it is Louisville property. Um, so I happened to be outside the next day talking to my neighbors across the street, and the subject came up about, and they witnessed the police talking to him. And so I said, well, we never did find out why, what was going on, and he didn't really get the names of, he. I think he remembered one, but he didn't really remember. Uh, and so my neighbor said, well, my neighbor, two doors down on my side, apparently the burglar alarm went off, and they were out there because the police had been notified. And that's why they were out there, but they never told him that. They never, and maybe they don't have to, I don't know. But, you know, the fact that in the environment that we were in, and at that particular time, it was unnerving. It was nervous. He was, he was nervous. But I'm thankful that he, you know, did what they asked, um, and, you know, nothing happened. But, you know, it, it, it's still, I think someone mentioned about, you know, using the power and asserting the power. Um, and there should be respect for law enforcement, but there should also be respect to me on the going the other way in terms of if you want people to cooperate and answer questions, do it in a respectful way. Now, maybe there's more to it, I don't know. But like I said, that's personal, that's recent, 
that's really my first experience, you know, of something like that happening. Um, I have experienced great things in Louisville. I've, our church, we have uh, worshiped with other churches here in the city. We've had great times. Our, Bobby's been there many times with us. We've fed the homeless. We've, uh, you know, done things to support schools. And as the pastor said, my concern too is because our church is in an area that's considered really the old Louisville area. A lot of the property that's owned, I believe, by some of those businesses were owned by some of those relatives that live in that area. Um, my concern is there's no grocery stores on the west, on the east side of 35. There's no pharmacy over there. Uh, what are we doing about the kids in school in terms of uh, if they're going to stay at home? Do they have laptops? Are we going to be able to provide things, you know, for them in terms of, as you said, make it equal. Give them the opportunity. The kids are our future, and we need to help them. Uh, those of us who've been retired, whatever, you know, we still have knowledge and wisdom that can help build a stronger community. We need to be about doing it and not just about talking about it. You know, I, I, I'm retired, but I don't have time to be wasting to come out if, if we're not going to do something. I can be just as creative and, and energetic, but I need to know that there's a purpose and a goal for what we're going to be doing. Our children expect that of us. They need that from us. And those who can't speak, we need to speak for them. And I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and work, but I, like I said, I, you know, if you're serious about doing something that I want to be involved and help, whatever I can do. But I appreciate the opportunity to be here. But uh, there's enough knowledge in this room and experience in this room. And I think the heart, somebody mentioned the heart. Uh, I believe that there's good and evil in everyone. But we have to choose to change. You know, I believe bigotry and, and racism, that's taught. You know, you see a little baby, I mean, I don't know anything about that when they come here. Somebody has to teach them that. And we have to unlearn and try to teach people about love and, and be colorblind and just love from the heart. I, I'm, I'm going churchy here. That's what God expects of all of us. And if we don't get on board, then things are never going to change and they're going to get worse. And it hurts my heart to see what's happened in the world, in the community. Um, but we need to, to be about doing something and not just talking about it. Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ray Bowens. And I guess I got two strikes against me. I'm about 6'5", so I heard some talk about that. I also live in Flower Mound, so <laughs> I heard some talk about that. But my, my business is in Louisville. I have a couple of businesses. Uh, so we're thankful that I got invited here because I feel that I'm part of the Louisville community. My business is in Louisville, and I pay an awful lot of taxes <laughs> to the Louisville system. And I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy that uh, all our officials are here, are looking. And I will be brief. I'm a Baptist, but I'll, I'll be brief, I promise you. <laughs> I, I grew up in a little town called Crockett, Texas. It's East Texas. And Crockett is kind of what you, you guys consider Mississippi, Arkansas, and all those kind of places in mind. So I grew up on a farm. I guess the good part about it, it was our farm. And I've done the same thing that someone mentioned about cows, chicken, horses, cotton, corn. I was speaking over there one day at Rockbrook House, uh, Elementary School to some third graders. So I was telling them what I did. And so kids don't have any relationship with time and period. This little boy raised his hand. He said, Mr. Bones, were you a slave? <laughs> And the teachers go, <laughs> you know, well, I kind of worked like one, but it was kind of deal. Uh, I guess the most uh, event that I saw in my life 
uh, I'm 66 years old, so I was actually protesting at age 10. I remember the election of 1964 with uh, LBJ and Barry Goldwater. And what's going on now is kind of, if you're old enough, it's kind of re redemption of that. And, and a lot of good things has happened, trust me. A lot of great things have happened. But also, we keep going back sometime. You know, we'll take step forwards and go back. And one of the things that, you know, we try to do uh, as a business person is to preach the message of entrepreneurship for our children, for our country, because that is so important, the role of entrepreneurship, because this is something going to happen in our system. You're always going to have a really hot economy, and you're always going to have recessions or a serious recession. We haven't had a depression since 29. And that's when things get reshuffled. Those good things that people had planned on doing, all of a sudden, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And, and I'm going to say this, and this is mainly for our black audience. The difference between, there's a lot of difference between income and wealth. Okay. Income will pay your bills, get you the houses that you need. Wealth will carry you through those recession and depression. So, but now, my experience in Flower Mound with the Flower Mound Police Department, I moved to Flower Mound in 93, and I think everybody followed us there because it has really shot up since then. I have never been stopped by uh, a Flower Mound Police. I've been living there all of these years. And I have been given a ticket to D uh, by the Louisville Police Department, but that's another question. I, I did beat it, by the way. Uh, yeah, a, a very, very short story about my daughter. Uh, she also grew up in Flower Man. She come home one day, I think second like or third grade. Uh, so I think she said, well, Flower Man. She said, Dad, I always asked her what she learned in school. And she was so excited. Dad, Dad, we learned about these slaves today. She had no idea. I said, okay, so what do you think slaves, Rochelle, who, who do you think these slaves were? Or oh, they're people who had to work hard and, you know, they're their masters. Did you see anything that maybe you had probably something in common with them? She looked at me with wide eyes. No, they were slaves. Okay, so who do you think the slaves were? She didn't realize the relationship because you know, there that she, you know, where she grew up and everything. And, and there was something in that story is the fact that many times it's how we perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. I did retire, I spent 30, almost 30 years in IT uh, with Bank of America. I retired in 2005. So I was completely burned out. And if you know anything about IT, like someone said, it can burn you out. It's a great career, but it will it'll burn you out. So we, we got into the entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the big thing, oh, also, I, be, I did those things that I'm supposed to do. Joined the Rotary Club, and Bob and I worked together. Became the president of the Rotary Club, you know. Yeah, yeah. Wish we had more people look like us there because they're a great organization. And now I'm one of the assistant governors in the Rotary Club. There's a lot of, lot of good things going on, but, and I don't know what success is. Maybe you guys do and you know what it is. But I do know someone said there's a lot of knowledge in this room here. And we need to share it. We need to figure out a way to share our experience and share our knowledge to our young people. I, I went into a store today. Um, that frequent to maybe our people and the, the music, it, I had to leave out there. It was so disgusting and, I, and I'm trying to wonder, you know, that's, you know, while I deplore what happened with 
uh, with Mr. George. Uh, can't think of his last name right now. Floyd. Floyd, yes. But we have a role in this too. We have a big role in this. And as I explained that the way history, if you look at history, you go back to 19, in the early part of the uh, last century, a movie called Birth of the Nation that really put the Klans as heroes. They had a president named uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was probably the most racist president that we ever had, if you read history. So things doesn't have a way to repeat itself. And so the question that I have is that as a people, and we appreciate what you guys are doing, but you can't solve all of the problem that we have here. But this is a great first step. And I just hope and pray that the police officers, you know, I'm in the business myself, an automobile business. I treat people like I'm treating my mother or my sister. And even though we, we may be speeding, I just wish they would have a whole different attitude to really de-escalate. My mother said one thing that I always learned, somebody gotta have some sense. <laughs> I, I'm through. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mathis Crowder. Um, me and my wife moved out here uh, to Louisville two years ago. Uh, we moved here to um, Texas in Irving Los Colinas about nine years ago. Um, um, one of the biggest reasons, we moved from Seattle, Washington. Um, um, we moved here for a reason to build a program, to build a school. Um, to build a private school to help a lot of minority young men. Um, the thing that we did is they love basketball, so we use basketball as a tool. Um, one of the biggest things we did is once we get them in with basketball, now we got them academically. Now we start teaching about entrepreneurship. Now we start teaching about being a better man. Um, but I, I can go rewind some time back. Um, I wanted to be a police officer when I was a kid. I'm gonna be honest with you, or a fireman. I looked up to him. Um, as I got older, it started when I was young. I was in the car with my uncle, he got pulled over, he got harassed. Then I started looking at the police differently. But I still wanted to be one. And then I got older, got to be a teenager, get ready to go to college, now, I'm in my first year of college, going to Coleman Community College. I'm in the car with friends. I'm driving the car. Now I'm starting to get pulled over a little bit more. Now I'm experiencing it at 18, 19 years old, 18 years old. So I'm like, man, I, I don't really like this. You know, and now I don't want to be no police. So now I moved to Seattle, Washington. So I said, I move up to Seattle, Washington. Seattle's liberal. Everything goes, kind of goes. I'm being honest, that's, how I, that's, that's what I learned about it. One thing about me, I read a lot, I study a lot, and I don't, I don't go off what the media says. I don't go off what pe people's opinion says. I go off what I read and what I study. I moved to Seattle. Um, I was in Seattle for like three months, and um, I was basically came, uh, basically not a police officer, but I was a, kind of big time security. I went to school, I did everything. I had the taser, I had the, the mace. I was dressed just like the police and I was working at this big old factory. And I take the bus there. I lived in, uh, in um, downtown Seattle, like near downtown Seattle, Yeshla Way. That's, that, was, that, was, that was called the hood. That was the hood near Chinatown. So I'll never forget, I was in Seattle three or four months and I went to school to be a security guard and, and I, I was ready, you know. I went my first year of college in uh, Mississippi and then I, I moved to Seattle. So I'm, I always come from work, get from work about one o'clock, but um, the guy, he's a retired police officer, he let me go all the time. Um, he let me go early at 12.50. So I'm getting out there, I'm running to the um, bus stop I'm dressed just like the police. Got the cap on, the jacket, everything. I just, it's just no say Seattle police. 
I'm running, I'm running to the bus stop. Police ride by. And you know, and, 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 and let's just be honest, as a black man in your blood, you feel it. Oh, and it's raining and I'm running to the bus stop and I'm like, oh, and he and the police officers stopped. Zoop, came back around. I was like, oh, I hope I ain't did nothing. I didn't do nothing. I looked just like them. I was, I was talking to myself. And so then, put the lights on me. Where are you coming from? Oh, I'm coming from work right at the factory up here. You sure you're coming from there? Put your bag down. Got on the, got on the speaker. I'm 19 now. Um, got on the speaker. Um, breaker, breaker, da 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 da, just talking. Next thing you know, five, six, seven police, June, 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 surrounded me. Everybody had the guns out, ready to go. The lights on me, I'm just standing there, and it's pouring rain. I drop my baggage, drop. Where's your ID? Da 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 da. I'm just, now I'm just so uncomfortable, I don't know what to do. I got my hands up. I was taught, my uncle taught me. My, you know, when my uncle got harassed as a young, when I was young, 19 years old, I was in the car with him. I'll never forget when the police harassed him and throwed him around, throwed him down, did whatever he wanted to him. He got back in the car and I'm like, I'm like, what? Uncle, you all right? And he looked at me and he said, you just got to get used to it. You, you, eventually you're going to get numb to it. He, that's what he said. So I had to go by what my uncle say. So... When these, all these police, police officers put the gun on me, I'm, I'm scared now. I'm thinking about what my uncle said a long time ago, all the experience I had when I went my first year of college, Coleman Community College. And so I'm standing there for 30 minutes in the rain, pouring, and they drive this guy in the back of the car, and, and they look at me, and they say, is it him? And he looks, and he looks, and everything for like, 15, 20 seconds going through my mind, I can go to prison. I'm up here, I'm a security guard, I'm going to school. I'm in my second year going to school, I'm trying to be a physical therapist. I never had a record. Now, I have been handcuffed from the age of 13 to 18 when I was in Mississippi, but I thought when I come to Seattle, Washington, it's a liberal state, you, it's kind of free. And so being there four months, I went through the same thing, but it was worse this time. So when the guy finally looked at me and said, oh, I don't think it's him. He dressed just like you guys. How could it be him? And they had somebody to go up to the factory and check. Was I just getting off? So you had the police officers up there, the ex-police officer retired. And he said, that's a great young man. That's a great black young man. And he didn't say black young man, but he, he's so old. He said, that's, that's a great colored young man. That's what he said, but he's old. He, he's a retired police officer, been in war in his 70s. And he said, why would you guys do anything to him? He's a good young man, you know? And so the lady, the lady police came back down and said, he's good. He's good. And so and then they finally came to me and I dropped the bag. The bag's still down and, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm soaking wet. And now I'm just, now I'm just standing and I'm shaking. And then the guy come to me and says, oh, you can go now. And then they just leave. But I'll say this. When this happened, the person that treated me the worst was the black police. He treated me the worst. He was pushing the guy to identify me. He was pushing them. He kept on over talking and asking them over and over. You sure it's not him? He said, he's dressed just like you. Athletic, black, athletic, built. And I'm looking at him. I'm not crying yet, but the tears are in my eyes. It's in my eyes. So there's bad and good in every race. In every race. And so what I'm saying, what I'm saying so when all the cars left, everybody left, it was this young white police, you, he just got on the force. I can tell you, he just got on the force. He came to me, you need a ride home? And I look at him and I just start crying. I'm all soaking wet. He said, I'm sorry, but do you need a ride home? I said, if you ride me home, I'm already 
going through a situation at home. It's all black community. Look it up. Downtown Seattle, right on Yeshua Way. That's a black community. Now they didn't clean it up. They're trying to push people out. But it was all black community. I was at the Bryan Manor. I was standing as a project. But it was a better looking project than Mississippi. So I thought I was living it up. I'm just being honest. So I told him, you can't take me home because if I go, if I go where I live at, they are already against me because I'm looking like you. So every day I get the real care, I, I, I get talked about from both sides. So I'm in no win situation. So being this security guard, had a taser and all this, I, I was going to school to be a nurse, nurse technician. So I, I couldn't wait to get this done because I didn't want to wear that no more. And then I got, just got harassed, got harassed in it. I went to go be a security guard and look like them so I wouldn't get harassed by them. You get it? So then when I went and got dressed in it, my people harassed me. So I was in no win situation. So I told him to drive me, drive me to Chinatown and I walked the rest way home. That, that's how I was talking. I was, I was, uh, I, I'm talking about it now and I'm uncomfortable because that experience was, was bad. So he drove me to Chinatown, and it was seven miles, seven miles away from my house in Chinatown. So I walked all the way home. I get home, my brother-in-law's at the house. You all right? No, I'm good. I was like, I'm good, I'm good. And I didn't talk to nobody. I held it in. What I did is I went outside on the patio, and it was a little, little patio in the projects. I just sat out there a long time and I talked to God and I just cried and I cried and I cried and I talked to God. At 19, I said, God, what can I do to make a change in young black men so they wouldn't get, no I was dressed just like them. So no matter how I dress, I'm still gonna get stereotyped. But I don't want that, I don't want to be a bad person. I don't want to have hatred. So what I did is, and I know this probably be strange to a lot of people, my thing was, I'm going to make change. I'm going to make change. I'm going to show young black men you can be entrepreneurs, you can be great. You, 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 can, you can fly like an eagle. You don't have to be a duck or a bird. So what I did is, I'm 19 years old. The next six months, I saved up enough money. I bought my own home, a brand new home at 19 years old in Seattle, Washington. I bought it on the outskirts of Seattle. At 21 years old, I bought a brand new Benz. Now, I got pulled over even more because I thought I was a drug dealer. <laughs> so no matter what I did, I was in no win situation. But it didn't bother me no more. It didn't affect me no more because that talk with God changed me. It didn't make me be bitter towards the police. And my mom raised us right. She raised us to be givers. My brother, my younger brother became a police officer. He moved down here when we was in Seattle, Washington. Years later, he moved down here and became a police officer in Arlington. And he was a police officer, I think, for three years, I think. I got to talk to him again. But he, he stopped working there. And he would tell me the stories. He said, let me tell you something. It's about, it's, it's, it's not a lot of percentage of, of, of ra racism in the police station. There is racism. It's there. I, I seen it. I experienced it. But it's not 50%. And there's not none of all that. But there's racism. And there's bad white cops and there's bad black cops. He said, I'm telling you because I'm right around it. He, so he explained it to me every time he went through something, he would call me every now and then and tell me. And he, 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 he was told, I want you to sit in this parking lot and if this race come by and that race come by, you got to pull them over. He was told he had to do that. It was mandatory. But you can't talk about it. He was, it was mandatory that he had to do it. He called and said, I'm not doing this. 
I, I don't want to do this. And I said, well, you got to do your job, but you won't be there long. But my biggest thing is all the experience I've been through of being harassed by the police and being, being just my feelings hurt and all like that. But that talk with God didn't, it just made me stronger, stronger man. So when I saw George Floyd, I cried like a baby. You can ask, you can ask my wife. I cried for two weeks. I just did. It hurt it. But it still didn't change me. It just made me stronger. All it did is, and he would tell you, he met some of my boys. I've been helping young men since the age of 19. I made a goal I would help young men since the age of 19. I'm in my middle 40s now. I done helped over 300 young men go to college. I mean, I got, I got kids all over, I got young men all over the world that call me all the time. They work in Fortune 500 companies. I push entrepreneurship. That's what I do, that's what I focus on. Um, sometimes I'll have a group of kids that's Mormon, that's Muslim, that's Baptist, that's Christian, and I teach them how to all get along. Push all the race aside, push the religions aside, and learn how to get along, learn how to love one another. This is your role, this is what you're good at, this is what you're good at, this is what you're good at. I teach them in the house, okay, you the best cook, you the best barbecue, you go do this. You clean this up the best. You the best bathtub cleaner. They all live in the same house. Miss Mitchell met them. Great young man, all races. Nobody's judging nobody. But it's all taught. They come to me differently. They come to me dysfunctional. They come to me in wrong ways. But you got to teach. And, and you got to have a lot of patience. You got you to have patience with Job. If you don't got patience of Job to help this young generation now, you can't, you just believe, live your own fairy tale life. I work with young men every day. Young men from the age of 17 to 35, almost my age, they still need guidance. They just do. And with everything's going on, um, police brutality, but th there's another issue going on that we all, I think all of us can work together. Black on black crime. Nobody's talking about that. Mainstream media's not talking about that. All these kids are dying in the streets. Only thing they talking about, we gotta run around wear masks and be worried about this, all stressed out. Businesses are falling apart. People can't live, People, they, nobody's talking about depression. You're losing your business. You're struggling. You can't pay your bills. People got to wake up and we got to talk about all these things. We cannot just talk about one thing because in the end, it starts with education. It starts with education. It starts with knowledge. All that comes together in one circle. That's how I feel about everything. And one thing I do, I teach my boys every day. Every day we have practice. I'm sitting down giving them statistics and talking about entrepreneurship. Financial literacy. I have four boys right now starting their own business. I have one, we have one we starting with a production company. We have one that's starting his own podcast. We have one starting his own clothing line. We have one that's gonna start his own sports management. It's already in the works. So it's about teaching them. One thing I learned about people and I learned about young men, when you keep them active and keep them focused, now social media will destroy them sometimes because they, they hypnotize you. But all I'm saying is if we work together, and I think Louisville, my experience in Louisville has been amazing. Meeting Miss Mitchell, Meeting this man, he's so crazy, but he's, he, he, he's just a lover. My daughter loves him. She's five years old. So, and meeting Bob Troyer, you know, meeting Donna. I mean, just, just meeting, you know, I met, I met the uh, chief um, on this, but I didn't meet him face, this first time meeting him face to face. 
But all I'm saying is we can find a way to work together to make change. You know, we, you know, the media puts up what they want to put up. We can't do nothing about it. There's nothing you can do. All the energy that the media is putting up, in the end, is all about power and money. But we can change Louisville to be strong, be powerful, um, our kids educated in every race. And, and, and one thing I like about Louisville, is more diversified. I didn't live in a lot of, uh, quite a few communities. It ain't too much diversity. Louisville has some diversity. And I like Louisville. That's the only reason why I'm here. You know, like I told Donna and, and Ms. Mitchell a year ago, our professional team, we was offered to move to Frisco. We, we had just started our professional team last summer. We was offered to move to Frisco. And Frisco ain't nothing but money there, let's just be honest. <laughs> ain't nothing but money and opportunity there. But we wanted to stay here because we love Louisville. And Louisville do want to make change. Like I said, that, that night played a big role in my life, going out on that patio crying and talking to God. If I wouldn't have never done that, I could have went either way. And it wouldn't have been nice. So all I'm saying is, as a race, we have to work, to, all of us has to work together. All lives matter to me. I'm, that's just how I feel. All of us matter. You know, we, we, got, we got to pay attention to what's going on in the world. You know, with the pandemic, abuse started. We, we got to talk about abuse. We got to, we got to talk about all these things that's going on in this world today. You know, we got to protect our kids. We all in here have kids. So we all got to, we, we got to pr protect all lives. We got to come together as one. And I love what you guys are doing because most people are not doing what you guys are doing. And I think you guys want to make change. I didn't talk to you enough and you enough. You guys do want to make change. There's a difference when, I can tell when somebody uh, want to make change. Because I'm, I'm the type of person, I'm going to be honest with you, and Miss Mitchell will tell you, me and my wife, and he'll tell you, if I see you ain't doing nothing, you ain't making no moves, oh, I'm done with you. Just like that. That's just how I am. If you're not trying to make change, I'm not wasting my time with you. I'm going to go make change for myself. And since I was 19, I made change. On Father's Day, you know how many people called me and texted me, young men, from the age of 18 to 31? I had 38 young men that have families. Text, don't have, half of them got families out of college, successful. Happy Father's Day, coach. That, that made me feel amazing. And she didn't met like 20 of them. He didn't met like 10 or 15 of them. They come to the, the chamber meetings. They talk, they communicate. When you guys meet them, you'll see what I'm talking about. Change. And all you guys in this room is so smart and educated that all you guys in here can help my young men. All you guys are having a field that you're in that you can help them in. All of them got degrees in different things. And then the ones that don't got degrees, we helping them get their degree. So we all can make change as one. So I just want to thank you for letting me talk. Sorry, I can start. Can you, everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I'm Essence Mitchell. I grew up originally in Atlanta, Georgia, in a mostly black community. So growing up, I didn't really ever understand what it felt like to be a minority. But unbeknownst to me, I was living the minority experience, um, the pros and cons. It's just life as I knew it. And at least I was around people like me and I didn't experience the microaggressions and understand how racism looked 
today. I just understood racism of the past um, through history class and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, like I said, unbeknownst to me, I was experiencing unfair zoning and tax laws that affected my school system, that affected the quality of the books that I was getting, that affected like the energy I got from my teachers because they were being overworked, the classes were too full. There was too many disrupt disruptions because of everything that was going around, going on around us. So I would say when I moved to Texas, it really slapped me in the face, racism, uh, because I was originally in the colony which is like, it's going from Atlanta and all like a 99% black school to a, I think it was literally at the time, 91% white and 3% black. So I just understood how microaggressions look, how life as a white person in this country and in a white school system can look. So I would say when I moved to Louisville, it was a positive change as far as Texas goes. It still wasn't like living in Atlanta, but um, it was better, it was more diverse, but there were still signs that diversity was fairly new to the community. And speaking with my friends who kind of grew up in Louisville, they, con they confirmed that um, a lot of the community, the number of people we see from minority communities has grown significantly in just our lifetime. Um, keep in mind, I'm only 20, I'm a s senior in college right now, so. Um, I would say that for the most part, like I said, I felt welcomed in Louisville, especially coming from the colony, but I did still experience being tokenized as one of the good black kids in school, seeing as although I came from Atlanta, an area where I was zoned to go to not good schools, not well-funded schools, my parents worked their butts off to make sure that I could go to school to to private schools for the first few years of schooling. So that definitely showed later on um, in the level of ed education I had when I came to Texas. So I found myself being called upon to like represent the black community at school. Anytime we had to do like LASD conferences or black history month programs or anytime prestigious people came to the school, I was presented with these opportunities but not so much my counterparts. Um, and I think it's important to say that I was never an official officer, student officer of the school. I was never a part of the student, like a student body president or anything like that. So um, it wasn't just kind of coincidental that I was called upon for this. Um, and I noticed how other students, other black students who kind of didn't present themselves the same way, who didn't have the same education as I did, um, who weren't blessed like that, were kind of seen more as an embarrassment Well, they keep them, you know, kind of hidden during times like that. They don't call on them for opportunities, even though um, they definitely have the potential and capacity to learn, um, to speak their truth, to be a part of telling their story, especially in things like the Black History Program, um, just because they don't talk necessarily as quote unquote what we see as articulate because it's um, kind of how, it's how white people talk. Doesn't mean that they don't have something to say and that they can't bring something to the table, but I saw a lack of understanding in that. Um, I saw a lack of understanding from teachers, um, understanding where kids came from. There was still, I would say, of course, like after Katrina and things, there were a lot of students that came to Texas, um, I guess from not as gray areas, quote unquote. Um, they talked different. They had been through a lot. And teachers didn't seem to have the same patience with them. If they didn't pick it up easily, they weren't the favorite student. Um, they didn't get it. They just didn't want to. If they didn't, um, if they seem like apprehensive to learning, it was just because, you know, they were innately bad kids, nothing you can do with them. So I found myself a lot of times tutoring my own peers because I understood where they were coming from. I had a different perspective. I had the patience that teachers didn't. And I saw that they wanted to learn and had the capacity to, if they were met at their level or with an understanding that what happened to them is not their fault. Um, the position they're in is not because they're innately bad, just understanding that this is a systemic problem um, and that not everybody has the same opportunities. So I don't know if maybe there needs to be more black teachers, more understanding teachers, but I think it's important for everybody in this country, black and white alike, because I've, I've run into a lot of black people who don't understand it either, that 
you know, black people are not innately bad. Black people aren't just in ghettos because like they're not in ghettos. Coincidentally, we didn't make our position in society. It's always been there and it's trickled down when slavery was abolished. That didn't fix anything. We were always, I would say third class citizens. So, um, and just understanding how that affects people now and how they're still not giving black kids the same opportunity in the education system all the time um, really bothered me. Um, I saw how microaggressions and attitudes of teachers can really silence students. I remember my junior year of high school, we had a poetry slam and one of my friends recited a poem about her experience as a black woman um, and immediately after, one of our white male teachers made a really insensitive joke about um, something to the extent of, like, can I hug you now? Or are you afraid of the white man's touch? And that just caused her to, like, completely prune up and not want to speak. And she was like, this is why I don't speak out. This is why I just, you know, ignore it. Like, a lot of us have been conditioned to do. Um, I was in I was in high school when the Trump election happened, when we back in 2012 and through 2016 when we saw countless videos of black people being brutalized by the police and we had to come to school the next day as if nothing happened and i always felt a different energy from the black kids and the minorities than i did the white kids especially like the trump inauguration and what that meant for a lot of us um and how you know many of the white kids came to school if not indifferent jo like rejoicing about it um, not understanding how none of us are um, less worthy of being regarded well in this country. Um, and yeah, so that's mainly my, that's mainly my experience here. I would say, you know, Louisville is not the worst place on earth, but it's not, it still has work to be done. I'm excited to be a part of this. I'm excited to make be a part of making systemic change um and like everyone else said this is not going to fix everything but it is a start i feel Just having just 
like just saying, yeah, they were taken from Africa, brought to Europe, and then brought all the way to America, and were used as slaves. But what, what, what before that? Like, what they do before that? Did they, like, what they do? Did they have society? What were their villages like? It's not showing us just as these savages or as these poor weak people that can't do anything about it. Um, now, my experience in Capel, when I went to private school in Capel in eighth grade, was actually different because I had an experience where I was racially um, targeted by one of my classmates. Um, now, the year started off good. It was smooth. Towards the end of the year, I don't know what it was, but me and him just didn't click anymore. It was like he just started getting very, like, he was just very racist. I mean, he said that his grandfather was racist, and I said it was probably, I was thinking it was probably taught. Um, and so he, he looked like he was, he was causing slur. He was calling me and my brother slurs. And like I did my, you know, as a big brother, I stood up for my brother and I said, "Hey, listen, you, you, you ain't gonna come for both. Hey, you ain't gonna come for both of us. You're gonna come for me. Don't come for my brother because that's that's my little brother." And I, and this was actually a good thing because when we got home, we talked to our parents about this, and um, my mom, my dad told him that this is this is the world we live in. This is how things are going to be, but we can change this. Like everyone said, um, there's not gonna, there's not gonna be a change if we just, you know, do all this thing. Like, you know, we need people to actually change. We don't want them just be like, oh yeah, yeah, go along with it. No, change. Like, actually want to change. Don't just go with something because you see it on TV. Like, trying to fix systemic racism is not a trend. It's an actual cause. It's something that has to be done, needs to be done, and will be done. And it was a very, like, it was a very nerve-wracking um, experience for me because I didn't know what to do in that situation. I just knew the fence. Just defend yourself, you know? Um, after that, that little situation with him, uh, there were no more problems. Um, we went through the year smoothly. My brother, my brother, see, my brother, he, he doesn't really, still to this day, he doesn't really understand. And for me, growing up in Shreveport, Louisiana, knowing the history of Louisiana itself as a highly racist state, I, I haven't really been around that kind of thing since when I lived with my grandmother. She always made sure I was kept collective and I wasn't exposed to any of this stuff and then um some things were like I always always ask these questions why why this like what why do people not like Barack Obama or why do people always say that Barack Obama is not the best president and she would just tell me oh that's just people being mean but like I didn't know what that meant but then I learned in the future that that's because of the color of her skin. Um, so when we first moved to Louisville in 2013, I've been here for like seven years. In 2013, my, mo my mom was trying to help um, this, uh, this man that was on the side of the road. His car broke down because his girlfriend, um, I don't know what his, his girlfriend did something. And um, my mom was trying to help him. And give him a ride, and his girlfriend was like, "No, we don't want the help from you, you nigger." And like for me, for me, like I, yeah, I was still young, and I didn't even know what like what they were, what they, what that meant. So, so um, to me, I was just like, "Oh my gosh, she's being really mean." My mom just started crying, and I was like, "What's wrong, mom?" She was like, "That lady was just, she just she's so mean." And I like she just couldn't believe that she was caught out for no reason because she was trying to help someone else's boyfriend, and she was just trying to help him because he, his car and he was sweating and hot, 
And his girlfriend was just like, no, we got this. We got this. She kept yelling at him. My mom was like, do you just need a ride? I can take you to where you need to go. And yes, I can call a touch up for something. And, and the woman was just like, no. And as I got older and I learned all, all this stuff, my mind was just blown because hearing this and now seeing it, it's just unbelievable. Experience it. Oh, that's unbelievable too, because it's like kids, kids do this also. And when you think about that, it's like you, it's not just adults, it's kids. That means it's being taught. And that's another problem. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna teach racism, then don't tell, don't bring it outside of the house. Leave it there. No one wants it. It shouldn't even be a thing that that should be taught. As a matter of fact, um, I felt like one of my seventh grade teachers was a little bit racist towards one of my Hispanic friends um, because um, one time we were in class, we were just sitting down, and she now he knew Spanish. And I was like, yeah, you know Spanish, right? But if it's a class. And you're teaching us how to speak a certain language, or you're teaching us what, like you're you're reading this book, and you want us to say that, or it, it, like he made she made him say it. Now he could have just helped one of us say it because my um, my friend Adam was reading, and he was just over there chilling reading the book too. And as soon as that that Hispanic word or the Spanish word came up. Uh, he had to say it. I don't think that's no. And so, um, seeing the George Floyd situation, it just shook me because it just made me feel like I don't think I'm safe. And I want to be able to feel safe. You know, I want to be able to feel safe. Like everyone else feels safe. I want to be able to feel safe. I don't want to be worried about getting shot or beat. Or call it a name because of the color of my skin. No, I want to be able to express myself the way I want to express myself and be safe in the streets while driving, while going to the store, or doing anything. There is no reason why people have to do this. And I, and I want to help make this change. And I'm happy to be a part of this group because I really feel like we, we're going to make a change. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Okay. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank you all for hosting this. And um, in the interest of time, I'll be very, very brief here. Um, as a woman of faith, God created us all. Um, we are, as a people, as African-American people, we are no different from anyone else. We wake up each day working as hard as we can to take care of our families and others. Because as Christians, we're not here just for ourselves. We are here to be of service. And I tell you, the last few weeks have been somewhat trying because, you know, Yes, it's a pandemic and, it, you know, it takes a pandemic and for us all to try to get on one accord here. And I know we're not going to solve all the problems of the world overnight, but this is certainly a good start. Um, I have uh, lived in Den County for over 30 years. My husband and I have been married for 32 years. We have two children, two adult children's ages, 23 and 20. We've lived in Flower Mound since 89. 
I retired from IBM uh, after 31 years of service, and I'm a small business owner here in um, here in the Louisville, Flower Mound area. And I'm grateful for what all God has uh, allowed me to achieve. Um, my mother was sharing with me a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't even know this, that when I started school as a young child in 1969, I was actually put in special education, special ed, because back then, in my little hometown of Hooks, Texas, kids who were black, a majority of them were put in special education. However, there was a black teacher who called my mother and told her, you need to go to that school and pull your child out of special education. She does not belong there. And my mother did the very next day. And you know, had that woman by the name of Miss Grace Goosby not done that, my life could, be, could have been totally different because my parents were very young when they had me. I am just 20 years younger than my, my mom and 22 years younger than my dad. They were children themselves having me. And you know, it's like, they were focused on, you know, putting food on the table, working hard. They didn't go to college. <sighs> so, uh, fast forward, you know, I, I must say I have lived a blessed life. I really haven't experienced a lot of racism some of the discrimination that I have experienced was at the time when I actually worked at IBM over those 31 years. I always knew I was underpaid, you know, but, you know, if you're faithful in the small things, you know, you just have to trust that. I, my favorite verse in the Bible is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. He will direct your path. And that's something I say constantly because God has a plan for all of our lives. And we're going to go through trials and tribulations in this world. And we're going to have good times as well. And we've just got to, we've got to learn to love each other because we're all humans. There is no reason to be mad at people and upset. I don't understand why there's so much hatred in this world. How do you expect, we call ourselves Christians, how do we expect we're going to ever see, go to heaven if you believe in heaven? How can you say you love the Lord and you can't even love your next door neighbor? So like I said, in the interest of time, I, again, I thank you and I pray um, that um, we embrace the fact that we, we may have our differences, but we need to embrace those differences and just move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. I know there's, a, there's three people in the room who have not yet chosen to speak, and that's fine, you don't have to, but is there anyone else online or in the room who wanted to add? This is the longest session we'll have, by the way. I promise you, we will be respectful of your time. I see up here, Pastor Langstaff had his hand up. Do we have the microphones? And then, uh, Jack?